Hockenheim in Germany is a new venue for Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe, powered by AWS Endurance Cup. It's the 10th venue to host an endurance round. It's a new venue for some of the teams and for some of the drivers, although one or two know the place very well from other championships. It promises to lend itself to a really dramatic three-hour race, the penultimate round of the championship, with just Barcelona to come after this weekend. It's a fast circuit, it's got one tight hairpin, and it always delivers action. Yeah! Just as Spa did at the end of July, where there was a win for Raffaele Marcello, Jules Gounon, and Danny Joncadea. That has put them into the lead of the championship with an 11-point advantage. It's been so far a hectic season uh, with really good results, but let's not forget it's only 11 points to the 71 Ferrari, and even with such a strong season, a strong win at Spa, we are still on, on the edge of that fight for the championship and that's what we want to achieve now until the end. For me, it's already focusing on the next thing, which is this weekend and Barcelona and trying to get that championship. The main opposition comes from Iron Links and the Ferrari. 11 points back are Daniel Serra, Davide Rigon and Anthony Fuoco and they're going to be pushing hard this weekend to try to claw back those lost points. We are showing that we have a really good car this year and uh, we are doing a really good job. Uh, we score some good points uh, throughout the race, but uh, we still know that the championship is, uh, is quite long. We are here in Oppenheim this weekend. We look quite strong. Uh, I think we have a good package with all the team, with all the drivers, so we are in good shape at the moment and I really hope we can keep going like this. Strangely, we're not talking about WRT in terms of winning the Endurance Cup this year. However, Charles Wirtz and Dries Van Thor are still in the reckoning to win overall with the two championships combined and in sprint after an up and down year. It started off pretty well in the Endurance, winning uh, Imola and uh, having also a pole position. But yeah, Polika, we were also going for a podium. Then yeah, we had a contact which led to a DNF. And then again in Spa, we got a yeah, contact which also took us out of contention. But yeah, we still have two to go here in Barcelona. So we will just go and uh, do our best and try to go for the uh, overall win in the races. That's what we can actually aim. So we'll do our best. We can just be focused on our race uh, and on our car. And that's what we are going to do. Another rapid Mercedes driver is Mauro Engel. He knows this place really well from days in German GT racing, all the DTM. And again, he's going to be pushing hard for a victory this weekend. It is a shorter circuit for, for what we know from the Endurance Cup, but uh, nonetheless, not a short circuit. Uh, long, it's not a straight, it's the parabolica, but a long flat out section with the hairpin. It's a good mix of high speed and low speed corners and definitely technically challenging. It's as competitive as it ever was, and, and for sure, you know, all the main manufacturers are in with a shot. If I'd have to say today, maybe Audi, Lambo look particularly strong, but, uh, you know, hopefully we're there and, and come race day, we'll, we, we can have the car hooked up. Rover Racing, with its new BMW M4, did pretty well at Spa. It scored points for leading at the six-hour mark and 12 hours as well, although lost out towards the end of the race. But Augusto Farfus is hoping for good things here. Of course, we do have experience, we know the track. But then it is a new machine to a new track. The tires have changed, so it's a new tire uh, construction for this year. I think BMW did an incredible job on putting out on the first year of the car, a car which runs consistent. It is also the first time that me, Nick and Nick are driving consistently together. But then, you know, we have to convert the consistency into victories. And then we are up there in the championship, so it's a big puzzle which we are putting the pieces together, but I think we are doing a very good job. After a really good result at Spa, winning the Gold Cup in the 24-hour race there, the Iron Dames Ferrari leads the Gold Cup in the championship. The car driven by Sarah Bovi, Michelle Gatting and Rahel Fry. We love the fact that we are leading uh, the Gold Class uh, standings. It, it's simply amazing. Spa was amazing, gave us a lot of momentum, not just us drivers, but also the entire crew behind us. And uh, this momentum is very important for the second part of the season. And we tried to keep that till the last race. Nevertheless, we know that it's uh, not easy. The competition is very high, but um, we are ready to, to take the challenge. The Silver Cup could be won this weekend, and this could be a title for WRT after a frustrating season. Thomas Neubauer, Jean-Baptiste Simonau and Benjamin Goethe are ahead and on target to win the Silver Crown. We're going into the last couple of races of the season uh, in a really good position. And, you know, we're not thinking about winning the championship this weekend, but, you know, we can win it, but we can also lose it. So we're just focusing on, on finishing this race and uh, getting maximum points into the last round. Chasing the WRT Audi, a similar car from the Attempto Racing Squad. Alex Arca is one of the three drivers, Nicholas Schurler, Marius Zug, his teammates, but they've got to make up 39 points to draw a level. 
obviously we have to be confident as soon as like especially in this uh, phase of time but yeah Hockenheim is also a track we kind of love all of us home race as well so I think there are some bits that they're pretty much fit to us and suit us but yeah I think we are quite confident me and my teammates the team as well all the mechanics every engineer everyone is pretty much motivated and uh, wants to do his best so this is what we're trying and as ever there is the pro-am battle to consider as well it's been rather Mercedes dominating this year. And Dominic Bauman comes to Hockenheim ahead of everybody else on points. It's getting closer, like tighter at the end of the season for sure. It's only three cars here now in Hockenheim. Uh, so everyone, if you finish the race, should be on the podium. So it's not a big gap in having more points than the other car. It's really small track compared to some other tracks for endurance round. But let's see how it will be. And it's nice for me because it's not so far from home. Let's just remind ourselves what Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe is all about. There's an Endurance Cup, there's a Sprint Cup, individual champions plus an overall champion taking the classes together. You have in the pro category, all graded drivers. Pro-Am is for platinum and two bronzes. Silver graded drivers only in silver and gold can have a maximum grading of platinum, a silver and a bronze. This weekend, we've got 49 cars for a three-hour race, seven different brands represented, Audi, BMW, Ferrari, Lamborghini, McLaren, Mercedes, and Porsche. The cars will make pit stops on the hour mark, and on each stop, they'll change all four wheels, there'll be a driver change, and you can only do 65 minutes to a stint. There's a minimum refueling time as well, 37 seconds, the fuel nozzle has to be connected. You score points if you get pole position in your class in qualifying, and then it's the top 10 that score points in the races. 25 for a win all the way down to one point for 10th place. There's also the on-site Fanatec Esports GT Pro Series. The top five drivers take points for their teams in the Real World Teams Championship. And of course, as well, Fanatec GT in Europe is part of the Global Championship. That is being led by Mercedes AMG with Audi Sport second and Ferrari chasing in third. So we are about to go racing at Hockenheim then, the first time the Endurance Cup has been here. Welcome everybody to a sunny Germany, much, much better than yesterday morning when the rain was torrential. But we really don't know what's in prospect here because qualifying threw up plenty of surprises. Some of the teams are good on data from previous championship visits. Some drivers, some teams are still learning about the place. It's great to be at a new venue for the championship, that is for sure. And it's a circuit I'm convinced that he's going to give us plenty of drama over the next three hours. Hours. John Watson, it's all a little bit different from that daunting circuit out into the woods and back on which you first raced back in, what, 1970? First time came here in 1970, but uh, this weekend it's a voyage into the unknown because it's the first time this era of GT3 cars has visited Hockenheim and everybody really is sort of sticking the finger, licking the finger, sticking it to see which direction the wind's coming from. So no one really has got any idea of what's going to happen as we go through R1, R2, and up to that final checkered flag. It's a very different look to the circuit than how it used to be. John, talk us around. OK, we have to keep up with the old map. So we get turn 6, turn 7, turn 8, 9, 10, down to 11, back into the stadium. Sachs curve, and there we are, back across the start-finish line. 16 turns, 4.5 kilometres, just over 2.5 miles in length. And uh, it's, a, it's a circuit that used to be very old school with two massive straights going almost all the way up to Frankfurt and back down again. Now it's a more modern circuit. Hellman Tilke was the architect involved and it follows the kind of philosophy that modern circuits have where there aren't too many super, super high speed corners, but a lot of slower corners, more technical corners to try and basically bring the competition closer together. But of course, the competition is so close and in fact, on Saturday's free uh, pre-qualifying session, we had the entire field covered by 1.9 seconds. I mean, unbelievable, 49 cars. Absolutely right. So it, it is uh, going to be a dramatic race and one driver that needs some points out of this second in the championship, Antonio Fuoco. He's on the grid with Gemma Scott. Antonio, obviously yesterday in qualifying, or this morning in qualifying, you seem to improve your pace after yesterday's pre quali when you struggled. What's happening? I mean, we, we found some pace this morning, but uh, we know it will be quite uh, tough for us uh, on the long run. But uh, anyway, we, we felt ready. Uh, we are in good position. We are on the first row. So we try to do, to do our best and uh, pushing until the end. You said to me that the heat could be a factor for you guys struggling. 
Uh, could be, could be with this temperature, but uh, I think we we found a good solution with the with the setup, and uh, we will see during the race if it's uh, working or not. Thank you very much. Have a good race. Thank you. Antonio Fuoco, along with Daniel Serra, who is not here, and Davide Rigon, are 11 points back from Jules Gounon, Danny Juncadea, and Raffaele Marchiello in the championship. But the 88 Mercedes, the Marchiello Gounon Juncadea car, had a nightmare in qualifying this morning and just seemed lethargic. Never, never found a lap time that was of any worthwhile pace, it seemed. And the, the car never looked alive. But just to go back to Antonio Fuoco's comments, I think one of the reasons that he's saying what he has just said is that we've got a very high track temperature, 46.8 Celsius. And that's not going to change very much over the course of the next three hours. And therefore, what he's alluding to is how are we going to cope with what is fundamentally tire degradation? And suspicion in the paddock, the little bit I find out, nobody wants to talk about these things. But fundamentally, mm -hmm. there are some cars that are certainly the quicker cars towards the front of the grid in that process might be a little bit more aggressive on their tire uses. And therefore, when they come to the back end of it, the three individual stints, might start to lose overall pace. And there are others that weren't quite so quick in qualifying, might actually benefit more as the progress goes through each stint. Cars making their way to the grid as you look at uh, Marius Zug's Audi. Matteo Drudi, another attempto Audi driver. Matteo Drudi is with Gemma. Matteo, obviously down here on the second row, a fantastic qualifying for you guys. Are you going to convert that into race pace? Uh, I hope. I mean, uh, it's always difficult to say. I mean, uh, until now, we had uh, quite a good weekend this morning especially it was not easy for us because on Thursday we had a technical problem so we couldn't use fully the private test we had uh, but anyway we came back uh, pace and this morning I think we showed quite good performance it's always different in the race it's uh, long runs uh, staying out of trouble problems uh, we, we, um, avoiding contacts but I mean we are all quite experienced uh, it's let's see I mean the car looked fast and let's see if we can repeat in the race are there any concerns over tire degradation uh, yeah, it's quite warm. It's actually, we didn't have so high temperature during the weekend so much so so far. So, I mean, we'll try it for sure. We will have to manage tire deck. It's going to be the key for everyone. Someone maybe more, someone less, but I think it's going to be the key of the race. Thank you very much. Thank you. If I said Matteo Drudy was at a temperature, forgive me. Car Collection by Trezor is the team for whom he drives, and uh, he's going to be one of the guns in that car. So is in the number 50 BMW, the Dan Harper. He's joined as ever by Max Hesser, and Neil Verhagen will start. Uh, the uh, American driver getting set to clamber on board. First time that car's raced here. I've got so far for Dan Harper in the background. There's the Antonio Fuoco Ferrari being pushed through this very busy grid. 49 cars set for this race. It's going to be a busy racetrack. Yes, turn one will be hopefully not a congestion zone, but I suspect the breaking in big break, first big break they'll have is into turn two, and that could see a concertina effect. And then the next big break will be at the far end of the lap into turn six. So two problem areas. Jack Aitken was looking good yesterday in practice, again in qualifying this morning. Let's hear from him before we go racing. Jack, throughout the course of the weekend, we've seen you very quick in both wet and dry. And you've just said to me before we came to you here that it's very, very hot. <laughs> yeah, I'm a Brit, so I'm not used to it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's definitely taken a, a turn, uh, the weather here. So, um, you know, I think everybody is a little bit concerned about the tyres and how they're going to hold on. One hour is a long time uh, around this track. It's got a very old surface, so it's very abrasive. Um, and the Lambo in the past was not the best, but I think we've got a good car. So, you know, we'll see. Absolutely. Well, have a fantastic race. Thank you. Thank you. Jack Aitken, of course, a single-seater gun before he came into GT racing last Two year. Uh, back from, thankfully, that uh, sizable accident at Spa. It's not phased in one bit, and he's as quick as ever. Aurelien Panis will start the Santalock number 26 Audi from 20th on the grid with Cesar Gazzo and Nicholas Bart. We've got battles, don't forget, not only for the race, but also for the uh, Gold Cup. Pro-Am and Silver, and Silver could be resolved this weekend in favour of Benjamin Goethe, Thomas Neubauer and Jean-Baptiste Simonau. They're coming into this 34 points to the good. And as ever, there is much attention surrounding the doctor. Valentino Rossi, he will start in number 46. Uh, we've seen him do middle stints, but uh, other than the sprint rounds, he's not very often the start driver. No, it's not. But look at the car cover, that's aluminium car cover to keep the heat in the cockpit as low as is possible before Valentino gets into the cockpit. It'll get plenty hot once he gets underway his one-hour stint. It'll be uncomfortable, maybe, because I don't know how many races we've had this year where it's been 46 on track temperature. That's pretty hot. Indeed so. And Valentino Rossi then racing here for the first time, be it on two wheels or four. 
National National Anthem to be played in the background as the uh, drivers get themselves ready uh, as the countdown continues for this penultimate round of Fanatec GT's Endurance Cup in Europe. Now let's go back to the grid because Dennis Lind was a real star this morning in number 111 McLaren. All the McLarens actually looking pretty fleet of foot. Uh, Dennis Lind again is with Gemma. Of course, down here in the Hockenheim grid, the first time we've been here in many, many years for the GT3. Is a circuit that you know well? Um, not really. I was here 11 years ago in a Formula 3, so it's been a while. Yeah. It's not changed too much since then, though. No, no, it's the same track. They've changed bits of pavement everywhere. I think this year they made new pavement at the hairpin and uh, one inside Saxe and that's about it, really. What's the goal in this race? Um, we have a strong car. We have a really strong pre pre package. We've been strong throughout Thursday practice yesterday um, and also in qualifying we had combined we, we could have had the pole really so I think we want to win this one and it has to be this one for sure. Well I wish you the best of luck. Is a, a bit of a chase down into that first corner? Yeah we'll see. I mean we have a strong engine so we'll, we'll be up there. <laughs> Thank you very much. You. Dennis of course made his name in Lamborghinis but he settled in very effectively to the JP Motorsport McLaren team. Christian Clean will start that car as you look on board there number 911. The Porsche Ralph Bone will go first. Yeah, just like I go back to Dennis Lind saying we've got a strong motor. Well, we know how strong the McLarens have been. They've been popping the timing or the speed list down into turn six. Mm. We had, I think, three or four of the top five. And I think the top speed we saw, best top speed we saw, was around about just under 280 clicks per hour. And uh, in a conversation before I came up into the booth with a, a driver from another brand, first comment he made to uh, the McLaren representative was, you guys are plenty quick down the street, aren't you? <laughs> no, no, we're not really, no, we're not. But anyway, everybody's clocked just how quick these McLarens are into turn six in particular. And of course, the McLarens ran well at Spa. They were uh, still there in contention come the end of the race on the Sunday. Uh, Rob Bell ready to go in 38, the Jota car. Christopher Meese will be one of the Santa Lock drivers aboard 25. And again, he's talking to Gemma. Chris, for you, this is a home race. Yeah, basically this. Uh, by the time, Spa is even closer to my home than this track, but obviously that's the only German race and endurance we have. So I'm uh, really happy to be here. Hockenheim is always a great place with good history. And a lot of fans here as well. They're loving it. Yeah, I'm surprised because normally, usually if you come to a place for the very first time, it's not so crowded, but uh, to see so many fans on the grandstands and even the paddock is super cool. And of course, the Audi seem to be running very well on this track. Yeah, we saw in the past already Audi has been quick here, um, but the race is long, it's three hours, so it's, it's a really demanding track for cars, tires and brakes, so really going to see how we end up. Which stint will you take? Uh, second or third, not sure yet, but uh, one of those. Have a great race, thank, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. On the basis that he's not in his overalls, he's not giving much away, is he? He doesn't narrow it down much, he's got to do stint two or stint three. Number 25 Audi there is going to be started uh, by Lucas Legere. And a quick stroll further down the grid, number 19. Uh, Lamborghini that will be started by Arthur Rougier. Who uh, gets his balaclava on, spectacles potentially to go on. He is a bespectacled racer. And there the uh, Emil Frey Racing Lamborghini gets set. So the grid starting to be cleared. The uh, teams, the VIPs, make their way into the pit lane at the one minute board, of course. The engines will fire up. And uh, then they'll have that formation lap. They'll get themselves into the two-by-two two formation through the stadium, ready for the rolling start. The five-minute board shown, though, as the countdown continues. And the safety car blasts away from the line. The leading car there puts itself into position, ready to control the formation lap. And we've not really touched too much on the chances of Mercedes, but the bright pink car number two will have Luca Stoltz as one of its drivers. Let's hear from him next. Luca... We find you a little further back on the grid than we expected. Why did you have the grid penalty? Uh, for blocking in the last sector. Um, yeah, it was not on purpose. Had a car uh, basically in front of me on the outlap and the car behind me on the outlap and I didn't see the McLaren. Um, yeah, it's three places um, and I hope we can make it up in the race. How are you finding the pace this weekend? Uh, difficult for all AMG, I think. Um, but we hope that we have a bit more race pace than, than we showed in qualifying. Um, I mean, P12 is not, not great, but nevertheless, I think and I hope we can finish in the top five. Well, you've got a strong lineup and a strong team that are certainly experienced in plucking your way through the, the field in front of you. Yeah, it's the first time uh, we race with so many cars here in Hockenheim, and I think there are a lot of places where you can overtake or you have to defend. Uh, let's see. Um, but yeah, it will be a fun race. Thank you very much. Have a good one. Thanks. Lukas Stoltz knows his way around here from many a season in the German Championship. 
and the start driver of that car is going to be Mario Engel there's the silver pole position car and indeed the championship leading car number 30 Audi that will have Benjamin Goethe to do the start stint we said in the free practice yesterday just how he's improved over the last few years as a driver yeah it's called growing up yeah. basically you know when you put a 16 year old into a GT3 Porsche uh, at Monza and he comes out of the pit lane and he floors at the car turns sharp left and ends up in the barrier on the other side of the racetrack you can only get better and basically that's what Benjamin Goethe has done he's, yeah. he's, he's still a young man mm. but he's learned and his pace is there and with pace then comes confidence as deep ends go he was thrown into one of the deepest there's number 51 Iron Lynx Ferrari that is going to be started by the British driver James Collado from 7th on the grid Miguel Molina and Nicholas Nielsen to do stints 2 and 3 in whichever order they elect so we've got the countdown continuing. We've got the safety car parking itself uh, in the stadium, should it be required. And drivers then on board, strapping themselves in. Number 12, Audi. That's going to be started by uh, Mattia Drudi, from whom we heard earlier. And starting fourth on the grid. So it is Audi, Ferrari, Porsche, Audi, McLaren, Audi, Ferrari, Audi, 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 Lamborghini at the pointy end of the grid. You get a feeling that this is going to be a long game race. It's not going to be about who is leading after R1 or maybe even after R2. It's going to be about who is leading at the end of R3. And that may not necessarily be the front three, four rules of the grid. We've got these two Mercedes AMG GT3s all the way back on the, on the sixth and seventh row of the grids. One would expect those cars to be much further forward, but for whatever reason, they didn't have the pace. But come the race, and because of the nature of the layout of the Mercedes-AMG GT3, they might be one of the teams that can mm. adapt to these very hot track and aggressive, you know, an aggressive track surface, maybe better than some of the competition. But as you were suggesting, and drivers are confirming, tyres, brakes are going to be a factor, especially if the conditions stay as warm as they are. Uh, so uh, we'll see what longevity the components have as we get into the meat of the race. The grid then, I think, is complete. You can't spot instantly any gaps upon it. Looking down from where we are over the pit straight, uh, we are positioned just about parallel with the front row of the grid. And that is where uh, the WRT Audi of Dries van Thor, Charles Wirtz, the start driver, and Kelvin van der Linde is parked. And, of course... Bizarrely, we're not talking about them in terms of the endurance cup for the championship this year. It is Jules Gounon, Danny Junkadea, Raphael Marcello ahead of Davedi Rigon and Antonio Fuoco. Daniel Serra absent. So if that car scores points, then he's not going to be able to uh, be any more a factor for the championship. If it doesn't score points, they've probably given too many away for them to be able to fight back in the last round were he available. So uh, it's going to be Fuoco and Rigon then upholding Ferrari on a... They're ahead of Marcello, Gounon and Juncadea on the grid. 88 Mercedes, no doubt we will talk about quite a lot in terms of where it is trying to get back up the order relative to the 71 Ferrari. You've got the championship situation to think about as much as the race. Engines are fired. The grid is just about clear. The mechanics going through the uh, two different access points off the track. And one there still on the grid with the AGS events car. Nicholas Goma at the wheel of it. But... I would have thought that might be a penalty if he uh, wasn't there's clear no, of it. No question, no question about it. But the 88 Mercedes six rows back to where the 71 yeah. Ferrari is in that front row of the grid. So, again, as I said, it's, it's, it's going to be not where you are at the first lap. It'll be where you are when the checkered flag comes out. That's going to be important. So the green flag is waved. Then from the Marshall's post opposite the start line, the cars accelerate down towards turn one. This opportunity to get a bit of warmth into the tyres. People are saying what a hot day it is, but they still want the temperature there so they can really push right from the start of the race. We talk about this being a three-hour endurance race. It's a three-hour sprint. Oh, well, very much so. I mean, in fact, Charles Vance leading, leaving pole position to go onto this parade lap looked very sprightly and lively because he didn't spare his car going into turn one. So clearly he wants to get brake temperature up, he wants to get the tyre temperature up. Tyre pressures also, remember, pressures and temperatures go hand in hand. So he wants this car to be absolutely as it was when he did that fastest single qualifying lap, the quickest lap of the weekend during that final qualifying session this morning. So Charles Wirtz on the front row with Alessio Rivera alongside him. It's Jack Aitken and Matthew Drudy on row two. The third row, Christian Cleed and Lucas Legere. The fourth row, James Collado and Benjamin Goethe. The fifth row, Valentino Rossi, Kim Louis Schramm. Row six, Consolapa Linem lining up alongside Mauro Engel ahead of Nikolai Sheergaard and Raffaele uh, and... Uh, 
Nicolas Sheargaard and Raphael Marcello alongside. Then you've got Klaus Backler and Arthur Rougier ahead of Rob Bell and Ralph Bone. Casper Stevenson comes next with Aurelien Panis lining up on the outside of the 10th row ahead of Marius Zug and Neil Verhagen on row 11. Row 12 is Alfaisal Al Zubayr and Brendan Arebs McLaren. Then you've got Alexander West and Lorenzo Patrese. Michele Moretta is 27th. Nick Yellily goes from 28th ahead of Yanis Fitia and Brendan Leach. Then you've got Arnold Robin, who got a grid drop for behavioural warning points on the totting up process. Hubert Haupt aboard his uh, number five entry comes next ahead of the Gold Cup Championship leader Sarah Bovey. Finley Hutchison starts 31 ahead of Jens Liebhaus as Mercedes. And Martin Conrad joins Sky Tempesta Racing this weekend. Louis Machiel's next and then Sam De Haan back with Barwell Motorsport, that car in the Silver Cup now. Uh, and he's going to be a man to watch in the first stint ahead of Carry Mergé and uh, Ben Baptiste Moulin. Sean Walkinshaw helms the Mad Panda Motorsport Mercedes with uh, Giorgio Roder alongside him. Then it's Hugo Delacour and Jeff Kingsley ahead of Ayanchen Gouven. A very quick Porsche race, a long way back, but he might be one to watch, Ayanchen Gouven. Uh, Ian Loggy, British GT Championship leader, is alongside him ahead of uh, Matthijs Blazic and Joel Sturm. And then it is Nico Gomar who rounds out the grid. So 49 cars we have as the field then wriggles its way into the stadium section. Looking back there from the pole position car, that's the rear view from Charles Witt's Audi as the field now turns into turn 13, the Saxe curler. If the race director, Alain Adam, is happy with the formation, he will give the signal that the race can be started. Deputy race director, Joel Duval on the gantry, ready with the lights to release the cars on instruction. The pace car as it is will peel its way into the pit lane. Looking back then from Alessio Rivera's Ferrari, second on the grid. And as they come now into the turn 16 exit, you've got on pole position Charles Witz. Alessio Rivera is alongside the second row, Jack Aitken and Matteo Drudi. The fourth round of Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe powered by AWS Endurance Cup at Hockenheim for the first time, is go, lights go green, good start by Wirtz, good start as well though by Rivera in the Ferrari, who slots in behind, has a look to the inside line, going third is Jack Aiken, fourth is Drudy around the outside for fifth, there goes Lucas Legere, but a great start by Wirtz, and he leads and he's getting away by a length or two already. Yes, yeah, good start, got into turn one cleanly, now the big, big break into turn two, everybody needs to be aware, traffic all around behind you, alongside you, be careful, as the 30 gets, the just completely, sort of muscled out of position, whether that was oh, contact, oh. and there's 46. Is that Valentino Rossi? It is indeed. Is that Valentino getting off track in turn three already? So, he's never raced here on two wheels nor four, and he's just explored Rallycross early in the lap then, as Wirtz leads, Rivera is second, and a real dive by Jack Aitken through the middle. Christian Clean hung out to dry on the outside, many of them go wide. So look, the Audi leads getting away a little bit. Rivera second, Drudy third, Aiken fourth, fifth is clean, a drama there oh. off the road, spectacularly goes Rob Bell in the McLaren. That's going to be a yellow, no doubt about it. I mean, a big contact going, basically coming down out of turn 10 into turn 11, and we don't know who hit who, but we saw the Drudy McLaren being speared off to the left of the circuit, and it is a safety car immediately, not even a full course yellow, an immediate safety car being deployed. Safety car then for Rob Bell, off the road and in the scrum coming out of the Spitzkehrer, the McLaren off the racetrack at uh, some speed, some force, so the race director straight away calls for the safety car and that will pick them up at the start of the second lap of the race then. So Charles Witz, I was saying, was building a bit of a gap, that's going to disappear as they come up towards the line because they'll all bunch up behind the safety car, so over the line goes the Audi. Second, it is Alessio Rivera's Ferrari in third place, Matteo Drudi, there they are over the line. In fourth place, Jack Aitken. In fifth place, Christian Cleans McLaren. Sixth is Mauro Engel. Seventh is James Collado. Eighth, Lucas Legere. Ninth is Raffaele Marchiello. And tenth, Kim Louis Schramm. Yeah, so I mean, having seen that shot, pretty big shots indeed for the McLaren, but one of the gainers, big gainers, was Maro Engel in the number two AMG team gets beat Mercedes. Likewise, we're seeing improvements from uh, Raffaele Marcello. So and those two have made up ground. Marcello is ninth, and uh, Engel is in sixth. And that's Arthur Rouget into the pit lane. And I would propose that he got involved with Rob Bell because he's damaged the bodywork and he needs a new tyre. Needs to stay on the lead lap here. I think they're going to be able to do that. And that is Rob Bell, who is OK and out of the car. That is very good news because that was a big, big whack. Yeah, coming out of turn six, he caught the very end of the barrier. You can just see that double wave yellow flag. The tyre marks indicated turn sharp left 
undoubtedly with an assistance number. That Porsche likewise is damaged. Was it the Porsche or was it the Lamborghini? We don't know which of the two cars may have been involved. That might have been a separate incident. I'm not sure that's the Porsche's bodywork. It's almost like it's got somebody else's bodywork stuck in its front, doesn't it? Well, but I wonder whether that's part of the bodywork from the McLaren yeah. or... Anyway, we'll maybe get a, a, a replay of that incident, but you can see the marks just beyond those double wave yellow flags. Suddenly, the McLaren, sharp left, nowhere to go, and big impact into the barrier. There is the remnant almost down at the entry into the stadium. Yeah, it covered some ground, didn't it? That's okay. for sure. Actually, that's the end. That's coming into turn seven, not the stadium. Yeah. So he went, well, the, must have gone the best part of maybe 100 odd meters or so before it came to a standstill. So, drama on the first lap. The first drama we had was Valentino Rossi. Let's just look at that one, John, first. Yeah, just trying to pick up where the Audi is. There it is. And whether he was run wide or whether he just ran wide himself but lost considerable momentum and also a consequence. Lots of places. Looks to me just he ran wide. No assistance there. The Porsche slides by. So, where is the McLaren and all that? So just, just gone through, yeah. yeah. So, Valentino's had to regroup as we go back now to safety car conditions. So all of these laps, of course, count within the three hours of the race. Lights on the safety car, meaning it's going to stay out. When the lights go out, we know it'll be brought into the pit lane, but it's going to take a lap or so to uh, clear up the McLaren incident and debris. Let's look at that incident, try and piece it together. So he's with the Porsche coming out of the hairpin. Look at the top of the shot. It's such a group. I mean, it's just absolute. There we go. So was that the back of the Porsche? Was that the back of the... the, the Okay, whatever it was, the, the Lamborghini and the Porsche were both there. Wheel comes off as well, or tower actually came off rather than the wheel. I think he got hit by the Porsche and that turned him across the front of the number 19 Lamborghini that we'd seen in the pit lane. So you've seen the damage, or you've seen some damage on the front of one of those Dynamic Motorsport Porsches. I think that was in the back of the McLaren and that turned him across the front of the Lamborghini. But it's very hard to tell in that uh, scrub. You can only really see the McLaren when it suddenly appears heading to the barrier. The good news is that Rob Bell is OK, and back into the pit lane is Arthur Rougier. So whatever they did a lap ago with just putting a new tyre on, it's clearly not the answer, and it's going to take more, I think, to sort that out. You saw the witness marks on the right front corner as the McLaren came across the front of it. There is a bit of the McLaren. There's a bit more being brought by a marshal. There are two more bits being brought by another marshal. Yeah, I mean, it's all the damage. Principal damage is all around the nose of the car there. The part of the front splitter, part of the bodywork, and it looks like a bit of a door also lying there as well. Let's have another look at the incident involving Rob Bell and coming out of the hairpin. So the car accelerates away. I think the Porsche is on his tail. Yeah, I mean, the, the McLaren was basically on the right of the circuit and the Porsche was directly behind, and then all of a sudden it kicks off. Here it is again from the forward facing angle, but it's really hard to see what tags Rob Bell. It might be that he moved across on the Lamborghini or the Lamborghini moved towards him rather than involving the Porsche. The incident involving Rob Bell and Arthur Rougier is under investigation, but it's not linking that to the Porsche, even though we'd seen one of those uh, dynamic motorsport cars with a bit of damage at the front. So we're still under the safety car while the incident is attended to. And this, of course, comes to the end of lap three now. The other issue is, of course, we see the damage to the McLaren, but we don't know how much damage is uh, to the barriers that the McLaren hits, or whether that yeah. involves or will involve replacement of some of the barrier, or whether it's being deemed to be sufficiently in good condition to not have to worry about further uh, changes to that part of the racetrack. Well, the dynamic Porsche number 54 of Klaus Backler has, as far as I can tell, survived. The one that's picked up damage is 56 Porsche, which is the sister car, but that was quite a long way back in the order, so I'd be surprised if that was involved in that same incident, in fairness. It's 39, the car that was started uh, by Giorgio Roda. The, the, the indication is this, this car 19, the Lamborghini, that's the one that's under investigation along with the Giorgio McLaren, so the Porsche doesn't appear to be mentioned in that correspondence from the race director so there we are looking at the exit of turn six and the short run up to turn seven and the marks from the McLaren when it skewed off now there, to me there's no protection in front of the barrier at the point where Rob Bell hit it so therefore is that barrier still in a good enough condition or would we have to wait and find out whether that's going to be 
requiring replacement. There is still bodywork attached to the front. That is not Porsche bodywork. No. That's George, uh, Giorgio Roda's car, as I was saying. Now, I thought that was the higher place of the two. I don't think, therefore, that got involved in the incident, but it's picked up something, uh, a legacy of the dramas further up the road. So, uh, just wonder, is that going to affect the, the heating, the cooling of the car? It certainly have a bearing on it, because the front of a Porsche is all radiators, and that is, you know, an effect of... It's like a massive big... Uh, putting a drawing board in front of the, front of the Porsche, and it's actually gotten into... Rotor goes slightly wide, I don't know why I did that. Uh, but it's probably bed embedded into the, 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 the splitter and uh, the area just directly behind that. Well, as yet, we're not seeing the team calling that car in, but maybe they're only now aware of it thanks to the uh, TV pictures. So, we're nearly not 10 minutes over there. The team is as Dynamic Motorsport is waiting for that car to yeah. come in. They've now so, noticed it, yeah. Yeah, and I suspect the car's going to go straight back into the garage. Um, I don't know whether they'll be able to... Two crew members will be able to re remove and ensure that the car can continue by just doing it on the pit lane. Jota has filed its retirement form, describing it as a crash-ending accident with number 19. So we can absolve any Porsche from responsibility, and it does look as though it was... Purely Arthur Rougier that was the other party involved. Into the pit lane now does come Rhoda, so the message has got through. So will that be a garage fit or just can they pull it away? Well, there's only two allowed to work on it at one time. It looks like they've got three of them at it. That's well embedded. I wonder how much else is damaged because that has gone deep into the front mm. of that uh, cooling area on the nose of the Porsche. Well, I hope they go and give that back to Jota because it's probably off uh, Rob Bell's car. So, the incident between Rob Bell and Arthur Rougier is under investigation. Arthur Rougier has now made two pit stops, but survives on the lead lap, and hopefully, from his point of view, can catch back up, as you see the cars coming back now onto the short straight down to the stadium. Of course, that used to be a much, much longer straight, with a chicane at the top of it to bring you back out of the woods. Replay of the start, and it was a good start, let's not forget, in all the drama that's gone on behind it, by Charles Wirtz to control the pace into Turn 1. So there, down into the first right-hander. Charles gets ahead of Alessio Rivera, and out of turn one, the Audi, even by the time they got to the next corner, two or three lengths to the good. Yeah, Rivera was focused on another car coming around the outside, so maybe that restricted his exit out of turn one, but Charles Vance was certainly on his toes, and he took full advantage and has put, well, pulled out up until the point of the incident down at turn six, you can see. Now, who was that coming around the outside? It, it cars on the left and cars on the right, whereas Vance was clear of the rest of the field and could take and choose any bit of the racetrack he wanted to. And already he's pulled maybe half a second on those that were pursuing. So a crowded house through turn one, and of course coming out of turn three, that's where Valentino Rossi ran wide, but uh, this was the view from 88 Raffaele Marcello's start. Growling the Mercedes down into the first corner, round the outside of a Lamborghini, out wide over the curve, back onto the racetrack, speed building at this point. Yeah, so watch the pink and the white Mercedes AMG GT3 as they come up into turn two. And Marcello is basically trying to double gang the back of that Mercedes that gets blocked. Unfortunately, the attempt to Audi swept across the nose of Marcello, had to check up, and that allowed narrow angle in the number two Mercedes AMG GT3 to gain an advantage, and that's what partly saw him move her all the way up from fifth through all the grid up until, uh, up until sixth place. It's a very busy part of the racetrack, turn six is wide entry and pretty wide exit, so everybody can look for an option and uh, in fact, Marcello has done pretty well at this phase to claw back the gap that opened up between the number two. But look, all of a sudden it's all slowed down and narrow angle was well wide and the exit of turn 10. So that Mercedes then running in line, it has gained a little bit of ground. So we're still under the safety car and uh, we await more news as to if and when, it, it will be a when, it is due in, but it's not necessarily imminent as the leaders go by. 
So it's one car and all the debris being retrieved and then any shards of debris on the road. But as John also made the point, the barrier will need checking because it's certainly taken a, a big impact and might be that some new supports are needed behind it just to make sure it stays in place. And it just looks... Also, just going back to that uh, 54 Porsche stoppage, had a quick look in there, a rummage, I would say, in the rules and regulations. And in fact, if it's an all fuel tyre stop, you're allowed more than two people to uh, to work on the car. So that was why we had three of the yep. dynamic Porsche motor group working on the front. And uh, so the rule book is certainly full of uh, information that's worth exploring. Yeah, it's two for the tyre change, isn't it? One, two, uh, the uh, two mechanics for the tyres. Yep. But uh, other, other activity has a different regulation, quite right. Well, the road is clear. So are we going to be clear to go racing at the end of this lap, though? We await news. Haven't yet had a message saying safety car in this lap, but we can't be far off it. I wouldn't have thought because there's no more work needed over there at turn seven. Everybody is off the circuit that was uh, working on the incident. The lights, are they still on? Wait to see the safety car next shot. Yeah, they are. So we're going to have one more lap to get them back up to speed. It's been a lengthy safety car period in as much as this is the end of lap seven and we haven't had a completely full racing lap before the safety car boards were shown. Now we're virtually 15 minutes into the race and not one racing lap per se other than Charles Vetch coming across start finish line to confirm that he was leading uh, but the safety car was deployed virtually immediately the incident occurred as more I suppose one might call it a glancing blow rather than a nose on impact so maybe that's enable the barrier not to be requiring any changes so the, the glancing blue would have dissipated the energy all the way there along the length of the barrier rather than one sort of little needle point and uh, hopefully the safety car will be coming in at the end of what will be lap eight just saw Costa Lapalainen going through number 14 leading in silver so the pace I would suggest is quickening now which again gives the impression that the race director has said to Jeremy Duval is the safety car driver. Up the pace, then we can get things back underway. The faster they go, the more the tyres come up to temperature, the more the pressures come up, the safer it is, therefore, to go racing once more. So build up the pace, then let them go. That would presumably be the answer. Tell you what, it stretches a long, long way back because they're coming out of turn four of the cars, and we've still got some just coming up to the timing line. Yeah, no, the, the field is stretched out, and that hopefully will also ensure that we get a clean start, but not only a clean start, a safe start as we look at the 54 Porsche back out on track in effect, the last car in the field because Robel is well and truly out of the race. Yeah, 56 Porsche, uh, which is the Giorgio Roda car, 54, Matteo Cairoli, Klaus Backler, uh, 14th at the moment, that one, that's the, the one I was fearing was involved. Oh, that's why we're not yet racing, because that needs to be uh, off the circuit, and that's attending to the end of the barriers. So I don't know whether they're going to remove that or not, but it looks like we may, in fact, have a safety car on course for longer than we anticipated. Yeah. That's the first image we've seen of, the, I mean, how, you might say how lucky was Rob Belt to catch that bit of the barrier. Um, it was going to be a big accident, whichever way you look at it, but there you can see the damage being done, and that's hopefully not going to take too long to straighten out. I don't know whether they've tried to straighten it out using that, what I'd call a tractor, with those two metal fingers sticking out to try and straighten yeah. it up that way or whether they will have to replace it. Yeah, I think they're trying to push it back into place, aren't they, rather than replace yeah. Anyway, uh, the uh, local officials working with the SRO team and the, all that you can do at the moment is keep the race going behind the safety car like this. And they've slowed down considerably uh, since we last saw them come across dark finish line. So, yeah, as you say, over 15 minutes now. The team manager of number 19 to the steward's office with regards to the contact with Rob Bell. So, after Rougier's car, looks like it might well be deemed the guilty party in all of this. We haven't had a Jota rep, as far as I'm aware, being summoned, but we do have, from the Emil Frey team, the uh, team manager of number 19 going to see the steward. So, I suspect this is the start of the story, as far as that car is concerned. There will be more news to come. So it was the right front of the Lamborghini that would have made contact with the left rear of the McLaren and would have rotated the McLaren and then when it got a bite it just went straight into the, the barrier on the approach up to turn seven. That drama on the first lap for Valentino Rossi has put the car uh, 20th. 
Now that looked to me as though the safety car peeled off up at turn Absolutely. two. Absolutely, I don't know what that's all about. Uh, yeah, I mean, normally, uh, well, maybe there's more than one safety car position around the racetrack, but certainly now Charles Verts is in control of the race yeah. as he is the lead car, but we're still seeing safety car well, messages on screen. The safety car has stopped at turn six, possibly with a problem, actually. So that's up at the Spitzkehrer, and the safety car conditions prevail, but the safety car is no longer able to control the field. And the, 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 yes, the 30, 32 car is now the safety, safety yeah. car. So up to the sax curver, Cam Charlwitz. And behind is Alessio Rivera, Matteo Drudi runs third, fourth is Jack Aitken, fifth, Christian Klein, and Mauro Engel in sixth place. So the barrier repairs continue. Do you want the good news? Go on. Only another 15 or so minutes before pit lane opens. <laughs> yeah. Well, the drivers have 65 minutes maximum to a stint. We expect, as ever, the cars to come in at the hour mark. What this does, of course, do is look after tyres and brakes because they're not using them particularly much at all, are they? So, out of uh, turn two, they come. And the field now accelerates through the parabolica. Let's, in the meantime, head to the pit lane because Marvin Kirchhofer's race never really started. He never got into the car because, of course, he was a co-driver to Rob Bell. Uh, and he might be able to shed a bit more light if he's heard from Rob. He's with Gemma. Marvin, a horrible start to the race for you guys. Very disappointing. The good news is Rob's OK. Do you know what happened? Yeah, well, first of all, as you said, he's OK. That's the most important. He had a good start, made a couple of positions, um, but then got hit from behind, lost the car. Quite big impact. But, yeah bad to see him walking away from this one that he's all right yeah testament to the safety of the car as well yeah definitely mclaren yeah we've saw it in the past they used to build strong cars so really happy that's always the most important that your teammate gets out of the car well and uh, yeah we've got one more round to go so hopefully we make it up thank you very much thank you leaves christian clean then as the highest place mclaren driver at the moment in number one 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 here it is again uh, so the scrum comes out of the first corner. Rougier, I think, had got two wheels on the grass. And as he came back onto the racetrack, that's when he glanced Rob Bell and just turned him around. And Rob hits the barrier twice pretty hard and then spins and spins tyre off, which is hit by the Leipert uh, Lamborghini. And the car has the good grace to get off the road, but uh, lots of damage done. Well, the one big uh, benefit of the McLaren is that it's got this carbon fibre monocell as the method of construction that McLaren employ in the, the build of the, the McLaren, the, 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 the brand, whether you call it an MC12 or an, a 720S GT3, is the same basic uh, chassis. So in terms of the driver protection, it's about as good as you're going to get. Yeah. And um, everything else in front of the car just dissipates all that energy. But of course, it's expensive dissipation and uh, a lot of bodywork repairs will be needed get that car back again and ready for either Valencia or maybe well, certainly at Barcelona. Well, the McLaren is back in the paddock and uh, there is the safety car ready to uh, make sure that Charlwitz is in position behind. So there's a flatbed recovery vehicle out on the circuit, but I'm convinced we are getting closer to restarting things here at Hockenheim, but uh, we've had effectively now 22 minutes of the race and it's been largely behind the safety car, as we say, it was deployed at the end of the first lap, so not a, a full racing lap as yet. This starts to uh, throw people's strategy a little bit, doesn't it? And there you can just see in the background the recovery vehicle making its way up into turn two, so it'll come down to this part of the racetrack and recover uh, whatever is there to be recovered, and then uh, once that returns to safety, Hopefully, hopefully we will get this race underway for a second time. Trouble is, safety cars can breed safety cars. They're all bunched up. But uh, amazing, out of all of that scrum, uh, Rob Bell's incident, that it was only one car that's been eliminated from the race. It could have been a whole lot worse, but not nice to see. And uh, the best news of all is that Rob was quickly out of the car and OK, but uh, not what you want to see on the first lap. And we wish the British driver well, of course. So the field wriggles its way uh, out of turn nine. 
little kink that brings them into turn 10 and then the corner itself of turn 11. Konstant Apolainen, the silver leader, of course, because the order's not shuffling like this. The only reason it's shuffled is thanks to the pit stops for Arthur Rougier and uh, Giorgio Roda. So they're in the stadium once more. We are on lap 11, but the lights are still on on the safety car. Another lap at least. That'll be a couple more laps, I think, before we can get the recovery vehicle fully loaded and uh, return to a safe point in the circuit. Ralph Bowen leading in the Gold Cup in the Porsche 911. Number 911, of course. And uh, he's making his way up now towards turn 16. So the leader comes through. Charles Weirts having a, a relatively easy time in this stint because there's not a lot he can do other than just look after the car, look at the dials, make sure he's in clean air. Others drop back to get some cool air into the front of the cars and then accelerate away to keep the tyres in temperature. And we're on lap number 12 with uh, their number 188 going through, which is Alexander West leading Pro-Am in the Garage 59. McLaren rebuilt after its accident with the Sky Tempest and Mercedes at Spa. Louis Machiels is second in Pro-Am and Ian Loggy is currently in third place. waiting for the circuit to be clear to get this race back underway. So for the drivers during the first stint, I don't think they anticipated this. No, I mean, anybody that put a rapid driver in first in the hope that they could gain ground, uh, it's also sadly a bit of a waste of a Valentino Rossi stint, isn't it? Because he's not being allowed to do very much. None of them are, but uh, it's frustrating for Valle. He's down in 20th place after his grassy moment here on the opening lap, and he's not being at the moment able to regroup get any of those places back while we're behind the safety car like this so coming out of the Spitzkehrer leaders come towards turn eight the field comes towards turn eight so the silver leader is 10th the gold leader is 14th and the pro-am leader is 31st at the moment, quite a long way back, relatively speaking, but that's uh, a car that will quicken when it's a pro behind the wheel rather than the AM, even though Alexander West is a quick AM. That's Valentino Rossi. And he'll be as frustrated as anybody because he wants to go racing. Indeed, and of course, in a line of cars like this, and it's a bit like being on a motorway, everybody speeds up a little bit, then brakes a lot and speeds, and you've just got to be aware that the car directly ahead of you might suddenly start to slow down very quickly. So I'm just watching. Rossi in the back of the 50 BMW and again just keeping your eyes skinned and forward there we see those eyes and the concentration is no less deep now in the safety car line than it would be if he was racing in free air. Indeed so as he comes then to the end of the lap comes out of turn 16 through that uh, long left onto the pit straight now. So the field turns through. There, Alessio Rivera, the Italian GT champion, brought in to sub for Daniel Serra this weekend. So he's not really a factor in terms of the championship, but he is going to be a factor in terms of helping to gain points in that car. And uh, this is how Alessio Rivera is having to accelerate and brake as he's behind the safety car. Just what you're talking about, John. Yeah, it's just you know, squeezing the throttle and putting the brake on. So the acceleration puts energy into the rear tyres, the braking puts energy into all four wheels and tyres. And uh, again, this left foot braking, which is the norm for young drivers for the last two decades. Not like the good old school, you can see the steering column going down into the front bulkhead. So just off and on the throttle. I was going to say, did you used to do this behind a safety car? But with respect in your era, safety cars weren't as common a thing as they are now. No, they weren't. Um, I don't think we did have safety cars. It would be pretty dire if we did. Certainly the structure of racing back in the good old days was nothing as well managed as it is today. I mean, even in your Group C days, there was the, what was then called a pace car rather than a safety yes, car provision. Yes. So we had the same problem. In, in, this, in the Group C car, you probably had a bit more space in the footwell. So you might have brought your left foot over to the brake pedal to keep that. Make sure the brake pad temperature, the brake disc temperature 
uh, was up to the operating temperature that you need to get a good solid brake when you hit it for the first time after a long period as we are here because the brakes will have cooled off dramatically as will pretty much everything. And you were a left foot breaker, I guess. And pretty much everybody was, I suppose. You must be joking. <laughs> left foot braking. <laughs> left foot's for the clutch pedal. <laughs> and for the foot rest to the left of the clutch pedal. To the line they will come. Lots of Valentino Rossi fans looking over from the exit of turn 16. But another lap down behind the safety car. Over the timing line. Everybody streams. Safety car in this lap. Safety car in this lap. Ah, excellent news for the voice of the race director, Alain Adon. So that's that's going to take us half an hour yeah, into the race. It'll be, by the time they come across to start the race for the second time, it'll be 30 minutes that we have lost due to that incident on the opening lap. So there is the safety car on board with Charles Vets. Now he knows what he needs to do. He's got to get energy into those tires. That's why you're seeing a bit of weaving from the Audi driver to put temperature into the part of the, 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 the sidewall of the tire, but also to get that core tire temperature, not the surface temperature per se. And again, while the tires will be warmer, they're not going to be at full operating temperature and everybody needs to be aware of that when they then go racing once again. And let us hope that they can all avoid making contact, at least for a lap, as they come into the hairpin then. Speed starting to build once more as the safety car will dive to the pit lane this time. And it's going to be half an hour, effectively, before the pit window. There isn't a window, but they'll stop on the hour mark. So half an hour before the first round of pit stops. In other words, we ain't going to get that much uh, out of these drivers in terms of competitive mileage, so they're going to have to go for it. Lights are out on top of the safety car, and Charles Wirtz then makes his way down towards the stadium approach. Yes, and he's backing everybody up as he is more or less required to do, let the safety car eventually peel off into the pit lane. He is now in control, and it'll be up to him, uh, to which point he wants to go, whether he wants to do it here coming into the Saks curve, which would be very early in my opinion. He'll probably wait until he gets to the entry of turn 15 and then swoops into 16 before he pulls the trigger and gets the number 32 WRT Audi back up to race speed. So this fourth round of Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe powered by AWS Endurance Cup is ready to go. Charles Witt's Audi leads. The Audi safety car is in the pits. Witt floors the throttle, accelerates away. Rovera, Drudy behind him, second and third. Audi, Ferrari, Audi up to the timing line. Away wide goes Witt, but we go racing again. Charles Witt tries to get the temperatures in the tyres as well as break the toe down to the first corner. Charles Witt then attacks turn one. Rovera under attack from Matthew Drudy. And Drudy, for my eyes, made a good start. Look, he's hidden behind the Ferrari as they come up now towards turn two, looks to the outside line. Can't find a way through there, but he's going to try on the outside line. That's brave. It'll give him the inside line for the next corner. They touch, but Drudy up the curb, goes through. Yeah, Jack Egg is going to follow through as well because that compromised and the Ferrari on the exit. So a good move by Drudy, very forceful, but he made it work. He went the long way around the outside. But look at what's going on. Jack Aiken is the one who thinks he's got the momentum now. And he's got a nose just about ahead of the Audi, but runs too deep, too wide. And that's going to allow the McLaren, likewise, clean to get up alongside. So McLaren, great job by Christian Clean to find himself in third place at the recommence of this race. So on board now with Alessio Rivera. He has dropped place, place, place. He's down in fifth. Look as the battle is ahead. Jack Aitken goes ahead of Christian Clean. Jack Aitken goes wide. Christian Clean swoops back around the outside of it. Fantastic racing. Yeah, well, Clean lost the advantage. Jack Aitken regained it, but then he was suddenly misplaced. Now the Ferrari trying to find a way around. Four wide coming down. Look, Maro Angle likewise contact. And around goes one of the two Ferraris, James Collado. And as the sister car is into the tower bailed, both Ferraris look like they could be out of the race. The two teammates tangle coming into the stadium. Rivera in the tires, Collado in the gravel. Iron Links have just thrown away any hope of winning a championship because the two cars have touched. The one that's going to get out of the gravel potentially is the worst of the two in the championship situation, James Collado's car, but 71 is in the tires. Well, that's a gift for 88 Mercedes. Oh, you couldn't have written the script for that one. Absolutely unbelievable. I would not want to be a fly on the wall in a driver debriefing later on in the Iron Links Ferrari motorhome. 
Well, let's see what happens now because that car is in the tyres and he's probably going to need retrieval uh, from a snatch vehicle, which might therefore bring out another safety car. But that is a disaster as far as the hopes of Davide Rigon and Antonio Fuoco are concerned in the championship. And it's just brought 88 into the top six now. And Iron Links can't believe it. Well, we can't believe it. What about the team? Absolutely. I mean, shock horror. Watch again. Look. Kalaru cuts up the inside. He's on the dirty part of the racetrack and literally just runs into the side of Fuoco's Ferrari. And he's just sitting there as a passenger unable to steer the car on the gravel and just noses it straight into the tar bills. And more drama Spinner for the Spitz the... Carrot. Yeah, that's one of the Santa Lock Audis that's gone around. It was effectively two passes happening and then they all converged at the same part of the circuit. That is it's a WRT Audi, forgive me, it's 33, which is Arnold Rovan, who's facing the wrong way. And this is what for, uh, Rivera felt coming into the stadium. Back suddenly, he gets a whack from Calado, who was up the inside of Engel. Yes, I mean, that was... I mean, James Gallardo was on the inside, coming into the stadium corner, and just as on the dirty part of the racetrack, he was trying to avoid the attentions of the number two get speed Mercedes AMG GT3, and that was then where the collision occurred between the two Iron Links Ferraris. Right, there's a snatch vehicle heading to the Ferrari. This might be covered under a, a local yellow flag, you know. We might get away without another interruption. So it is Charles Witz leading the way but the car that is second in the championship out of the race. Now, in other news, number 19, Arthur Rougier, is being given a uh, penalty, which is a stop-and-go penalty of 10 seconds for causing a collision. And uh, Rob Bell confirms that he is absolutely fine after the accident, just something off, as you can imagine what the missing word might be. But the good news is he's OK, and he's confirmed that to us. But uh, his aggressor, Arthur Rougier, is set for a 10-second stop-go penalty. It's all happening. Yep, and just, just about to kick off as well because we've got the number two Mercedes AMG GT3 and the 88. And Raffaele Marcello has been very busy in the headlight flashers trying to get the attention. Is that something Debbie in the middle of the road just coming through the exit of turn five? He wants to get ahead of that, get speed number two Mercedes because he needs to get the maximum point possible to ensure that their lead and they've been given the opportunity to maximize their opportunities because the two Ferraris, but critically the 71 Ferrari is out. Absolutely right. As you say, you could not make it up. So coming into the stadium, high drama. And Alessio Rivera out of the race. Now, of course, part of that started by losing the position early on to Matteo Drudi. If he hadn't dropped back behind the Audi, he would not have been in that position anyway. But Drudi is taking the battle to Wirtz. This is a big dive by Hubert Haupt up the inside, coming into the stadium. And that's a yellow flag zone just rescinded the yellow flag so how goes through Ugh, that was, that was uh, close and uh, that was very very close indeed luckily luckily the green flag had been replaced the, the yellow but look and see Matteo Drudy he is definitely not going to give up any chance of getting into the lead and again Marcello closing on Maro Engel as they go through turn one yeah and there's of course also the inter Nissan Mercedes battle there Marcello and Engel both want to prove their top dog in the Mercedes AMG stable as Valentino Rossi dives through on the inside line there, picks up a place against Ralph Bone. Now, admittedly, Ralph Bone is uh, not a, a graded driver at the same level as Valentino Rossi, and he's lost another place there, look as well, to Nick Yellowly. But Rossi gains ground, so does Yellowly, and the gold cup leading Porsche falls back a couple of spots but maintains its class lead. Yes, yeah, so that was a clean overtake by Valentino into turn one, slightly on the inside line, but he got the track position, which is what he needed, and yeah. he made that pass, so he'll be happy to make that level of progress. Nice move. Uh, have a look behind 9-11. You see the McLaren of Brendan Areev, that's second in gold. So the Porsche versus the McLaren for Gold Cup leadership here. Out of the hairpin at the Spitzkehrer. Uh, Valentino Rossi has got Nick Yellowly behind him, but then the Gold Cup battle, Porsche versus McLaren. Through they dive. There goes Hubert Haupt, blue and yellow. Mercedes AMG as the field turns into turn eight here. All very tight and not very much yielding being done. Everybody's being very defensive of their position. They realize that if you lose a position, it's a lot harder to get it back than it is to defend it. It's very, very true as they dive into the stadium once more. So the Ferrari, I think I'm right in saying, is out of the way. Those green flags showing once more. Fastest lap of the race, Lucas Leger, number 25 for Santa Lock in seventh place as Brendan Areev hustles along behind Ralph Bone. And to the uh, completion of the lap, this is the end now of lap uh, 18 for them. Despite Gemma's best efforts, uh, 
uh, conversation is not forthcoming from Iron Links at the moment. I can't imagine why. Can't imagine why, but I would imagine once um, temperatures have cooled down and rationale has returned, we might get an opportunity. But I mean, you know, it's one thing having one of your cars go off, but the car that is the principal competitor and challenger to the leading car in the championship, and that car was starting much further behind your car. Well, you can go on and on and on and yeah. on and, and, and try to justify not what happened, but how it happened. And, um, well, we maybe get an explanation further into this event. Well, James Collado is still going in 40th place now. As I say, he was the one that survived. But the yellow Ferrari is out of the gravel. I can see it just out of our window. It's parked on one of the access roads, so it's out of the race. It's done. This is the silver leading Lamborghini, Constant Lapalainen, at the wheel of number 14. The car he shares with Mick Vishofer and the very rapid South African driver, Stuart White. Nikolai Sheergaard chasing in the silver contest. He's second. And then directly behind him, look, Benjamin Goethe in the Gulf liveried Audi. Uh, and he is third. And, of course, the championship leader within uh, Silver Cup. So as the cars come towards the end of lap number 19, Alfa Rougier to serve that penalty. So we've lost a McLaren, we've lost a Ferrari. Benjamin Gerson goes through there. That was the car I was mentioning, third in silver. Charles Wirtz, the leader in the race outright, has just up the fastest lap of the race now. So Charles Wirtz leads, but he can't really shake off Matteo Drudy. It's less than a second between those two. Now, Drudy was, again, very, very impressive, very forceful to get up to that position to challenge. And he's going to give Charles Wirtz enough to keep him on his toes. Charles versus lap, 138.6, a very good race lap this early in the race, albeit the tyres are relatively still very fresh and the fuel load has come down by probably about a third, but nonetheless, Drudy eight-tenths of a second behind, Christian Klein a further one and a half seconds behind that battle that's taking place for the lead. There we are on board Marcello, who has not been able to make any further progress, just under half a second behind Maro Engel, and all that headlight flashing has been to no avail. Engel just ignoring it and saying, if you get past me, it's up to you. In the pits is Arthur Rougier serving his stop and go penalty. That's his third pit stop within 40 minutes. Two for damage and then this penalty as you ride on board again with Mark Giello. Christian Kleen's done an absolute best in the middle sector. The JP Motorsport McLaren going really nicely here. Down into the Saks curve. So the gap fractionally closing up here on the infield part of the circuit. Let's watch and see what happens when they come across start finish and then progress out onto another lap. They're coming up to conclude lap, tw uh, lap uh, 20. So yeah, timing and scoring will indicate they were four tenths of a second behind and the gap is now four tenths of a second. So Christian Clean goes through. Vincent Abril, Dennis Lynn to share the car. I would imagine Vincent Abril will get in next. And there, look, under attack from Jack Aitken. This means they're dropping back from the Audis. They're having this private fight for third. Fifth over their shoulder is Mauro Engel. Sixth is Raffaele Marchiello. Lucas Legere, seventh, eighth, Consul Apollinen. Ninth, Kiblu Ishram. And tenth, Nikolai Sheergaard. But really, 19 minutes or so before you can expect people in the pits. Yeah, and Jack Aitken in the Lamborghini is going to have to think of a way to find a way around, any way around the McLaren because we have already trailed the pace that the McLaren has got in a straight line. That will give Christian Clean a little bit of you know, a buffer. Maybe in an overall lap time, Jack Aiken in the Lamborghini would be the quicker of the two cars. But whereabouts is he going to be able to get close enough to think about making a move on the black and gold McLaren? I mean, I'm sure he's worked out the options. I don't know how many there are. Don't look like there's an awful lot of those options available just right now. I agree with that, certainly, as Charles Witt is just starting to edge away from Mattia Drudy now, despite Mattia's efforts on the restart to get second place, to go after Witt. That gap has widened a touch, as you see the Mercedes there, fifth and sixth coming towards us, Angle ahead of Marciello still. Through the Saxe curve they come. But the Mercedes already dropping away. Engel, for example, is the best part of five seconds off the lead, and we're not yet at the end of the first hour. It's going to be hard even to make that back as they come up over the line. And this is why I think we're seeing Marcello on the headlight flasher, because he believes that he can lap quicker than Mauro Engel, and what he doesn't want to do is let this group of cars, third and fourth, battling to get out of his reach. He's only got 17 or so minutes before he's going to be coming in to hand over the car. 
and he will want to do so. Al Bidani Yunkadela, we suspect, will take over the middle stint. And he wants to get on terms with these battling third and fourth position cars. Now, an incident between Brendan Leach and Valentino Rossi has been noted. It was up at turn two. We've not seen it, but something has happened between the pair, and it has been noted. So, uh, race officials will try and have a look at that. This that wasn't what we saw in the opening lap, where we saw Rossi go wide. That looked to me as if Rossi did it all on his yeah. own. Maybe there's been another incident we haven't kept. Haven't been able to capture it. Yeah, he was well ahead on the grid of, of number 27, was Valentino, so it shouldn't have been that one. I think it was uh, in his efforts to get back up the order. That's the Barwell Lamborghini into the pit lane, and that's too early for it to be uh, one of the mandatory stops, so this is a problem. It might be tyre-related. There is debris on the road. The teams have been warned that there is debris uh, near turn five, but that looks a bit low to me. Yeah, the right rear looks like it's done, so he's had to come back on his pace not to do any additional damage to that right rear. There it is. So the right rear is being removed and the replacement fitted because they're still 16 or so minutes away from what would be the normal pit stop refueling driver yeah. change. Jack Aiken really, really keeping Christian clean on his toes quicker through this part of the racetrack. As we see the race leaders, look at Aiken, wow, yeah. the body language of that Lamborghini. Way up the curb coming out of the last corner. Uh, the Barwell Lamborghini rejoined just ahead of the leaders to stay on that lead lap as Marchiello bangs it up the curve into turn one. Still chasing Angle. And there, Jack Aitken thinks about a move on the inside line, commits to a move on the inside line, goes through on the inside line. Great stuff. But he will be victim to the McLaren. We know that the McLaren can, uh, came out of the turn two on a better line. He's got straight line speed advantage, already trying to pull out of the slipstream of, of the Lamborghini. Goes to the left when he dived on the inside into turn six. Jack Aiken's going to hover in the middle of the racetrack. Now moves to the right. The McLaren just about to get side by side, but not able to do anything under braking. So really impressive drive by Aiken to find a way around Christian Clean. So down towards turn eight they come. So number 63, Jack Aitken, now tries to shake off Christian Clean. But perhaps the team's now starting to think about the uh, first round of pit stops. Maciej Blazek, the bravest of all, going through the VMAX, the top speed point, which is through Parabolica up towards the Spitzkehrer on the race vision powered by AWS graphic. As there, Mauro Engel turns his way out of the Zaps curve. The lead gap. I reckon he's coming down. Drudy's closing on Weirs again. OK, but this gap, third, fourth, fifth and sixth, is beginning to close up as well. Certainly, now that Christian Clean is behind Jack Aiken, you're going to see Mauro Engel on the tail of the, of the uh, McLaren, and likewise, that's going to drag Marcello up, so that's going to be a three-way battle for what will be ultimately fourth position. So 1.3 seconds is now half a second between these two for the race lead, so Drudy very definitely is back at the races. Now, is that because Charles Vett's pushed so hard so early and maybe is beginning to get a little bit of tire degradation. Maybe the back of the rear tires have just said, look, we're on the limit, we can't do any more. Maybe did Matt Matteo Drudy look after his tires? I don't know, but that's only a supposition from the commentary booth, but something has caused Drudy to be able to run down the 32 RD relatively quickly over the last couple of laps. Yeah, it's not traffic, that's for sure. There is a Barwell Lamborghini up the road, but it's not in the way. They've not had to encounter it yet, so you can't blame that. So Charles Witt, uh, has lost a little bit of pace. Now, on this lap, he is only 100 slower in the first sector, but he's not really getting away from Matteo Drudy, who can smell the race lead here before the pit window, the pit, before the pit stop that he will make at the end of the first hour. So down they come into the stadium. Number 32, WRT, versus number 12, the car collection run, Audi, Charles Witt ahead of Matthew Drudy, and in the second sector, Drudy quicker again. And Sam Dehan in the Barwell Motorsport Lamborghini will hopefully be given information that the race leaders, Charles Fertz and Matteo Drudy, are in a race for the lead, and hopefully that will lead. And you can see it just a much, but just again, Jack Aiken has pulled away from Christian Clean. Yeah. So Sam Dehan is getting the message from Charles Fertz, and that will be manner from heaven from Matteo Drudy. He'll be watching now how Vertz is going to deal as we look back into the garage. So up the inside, has he got it done? Yes, he has. 
And will that allow Drudy to swoop through as well? No, he doesn't, so Drudy is lost out. In turn two, and Charles Fairs will be thinking, wow, that was a stroke of luck for me. <laughs> and now the Audi gets alongside up on the inside, coming down this long, sweeping turn five. So Charles Wirtz, then the race leader, but Matthew Drudy gets past the Lamborghini now as well. And uh, that brings him once more back onto the tail of the leading car into the hairpin. So through they come, this being lap 25 now, with about 12 minutes before you can anticipate cars to be heading into the pit lane. So Jack Aiken again extending that advantage over Christian Clean, and maybe within the next 11 minutes or so, assuming he can get through the Barwell Motorsport Lamborghini, which I assume will be helpful, could end up not very far away from Matteo Drudi in second place, and more to the point, Charles Vett's leading. Well, all really 88 has to do now is just bank some points, keep out of trouble. But this gap has really come down, as you say, between Clean and Engel, and much yellow is there as well. So having dropped back behind the Lamborghini, Christian Clean's pace has not disappeared, but it's certainly not picked up, has it? He's, he's going to have to work hard in the remainder of this stint to keep at bay the two Mercedes. Well, his, his advantage will be again in the straight line. We've seen three of the top five cars are McLaren's in straight line performance, but also what is important is not just your top speed, it's where you attain it, and McLaren will be attaining their top speed at the very end of the straight, where others are attaining it before they get to the end of the straight, as the two Mercedes are beginning to line up, and running behind, we've got Lapalina and in the Lamborghini in settled position, also joining in this battle. Now, further up the road, lead gap was up to seven tenths of a second again last time after the traffic with Drudy. Jack Aitken in third. Now, he was lapping quicker than the two ahead of him last time, partly because he's not yet encountered the Barwell Lamborghini of Sam De Haan, which is running in 47th and currently, therefore, last place. Marcello comes out of the Schmitzker and back onto the power. And there is Jules Gounon. Danny Junkadea with his helmet on, ready to get on board. So that tells you the order of driver in 88, doesn't it, at uh, Akudis ASP. And there, look, number 14, Comte de Lapalainen, the silver leader, right on the back now of Marcello. Yeah, and Marcello didn't really want anybody challenging from behind. He wants to have always a focus on the back of Arrow Engel's car. And now he's going to have to deal with Lapalainen, because if that Lambo gets, again, a good run on the Mercedes, that means that all of a sudden, Marcello has got to think forward and backwards at the same time, and he doesn't really want to have that rearward view filled with a Lamborghini. So as the race leaders come up towards the timing line, the gap was seven tenths last time. It's down to six tenths as Drudy fights back, and Sam Dehan is bringing the Barwell Lamborghini back into the pit lane. So clearly all is not well for that car, as again, Marcello rides the kerb on the inside of turn one. Charles Wirtz, the man with the fastest lap of the race to his name, but on the previous lap, Jack Aitken did an absolute best within sector two. And now look, clean, Engel, Marcello, Lapalina. This is four, fifth, six, seven. They're all running together. And Marcello a little closer than probably at any point so far in this race. Looking at the rear of Marrow Engel and the pink and white Mercedes AMG GT3, just able to maintain its straight line of advantage. But look, Lamalanen's coming on the outside. He'll look for the undercut on the number 88. Wirtz has got a problem. Wirtz has got a problem. The race leader, look, has slowed, coming out of the Spitzkara, and Charles Wirtz has slowed. Now, he's picked up pace again. It's not a puncture, but something slowed him, like a lack of drive, lack of gear, coming out of the Spitzkara there. Well, it's difficult to say what it would be other than a deflating tyre. So will he make it into the pits, or will he decide he's got and adjust on the cockpit where he can reset something. But that is a scare for the 32 WRTRD, that is for sure. Well, let's have a look in replay then. He comes into the corner. Oh, he overshoots. Goes deep, yeah. Overshoots. So, was that the reason that momentum went? So, Charles Fitz, where is Matteo Drudy? Is that him up ahead? Yep, Drudy's leading. So, Drudy gained because of that error under braking. Now, was that an error, driver error? Was that a, a, a brake issue that Verts was caught out by? And uh, suddenly, in fact, he's in third position. Yeah, goes through third. So it is Drudy from Aitken, a second and a half between the two of them. And Charles Witz down to third, ahead of Clean, Engel, and Marchiello rounding out the top six now. 
So I'd like to know more as to what occurred for Charles Fairs because mm. that didn't look as if it was, in my view, purely down to the driver. So whether there was something, you know, let's have a look again and see if we can get a... So there is Rudy, and then all of a sudden, just how far Charles Fairs goes up. Not only goes in far, he picks up a load of rubbish on yeah. his tires. Jack Aiken comes up with all the momentum. So Fairs is trying to re... Watch again. Sorry, but, just watching this battle going on for fifth, sixth, and seventh. But it was a long time before he picked up pace again, wasn't yes. it? So he was either in the wrong gear going into the hairpin and couldn't drive out of the corner because you'd have thought that he'd be straight on his toes to try and retaliate. There was none of that. It took him a while to get back up to pace. I mean, all I can assume is maybe he, maybe there's a gear shift problem. Maybe the downshift didn't shift down to the gear he wanted, and maybe he was in a higher gear than he would like to be in, and that's where lack of acceleration would have come from. All ifs, ands, or buts, yeah. no doubt we'll find out a little later. The team manager of number 71, the yellow Ferrari, being summoned to see the stewards immediately uh, regarding the contact coming into the stadium. So, uh, I'm not quite sure that you can blame Rivera for that, but anyway, the stewards want to talk to the team about it. And James Collado, that survived that, is up into 32nd place, and the incident between the two is under investigation. So the race leaders have now done 28 laps. They come across the line. The leader is Matthew Drudy. Jack Aitken is now two seconds back. The margin widened last time through. We've had a pit stop out of Ralph Bone. Uh, and 9.11 is now Alfred Renner. We've had treble seven in. Alfaisal al Zubayr giving way to Axel Jeffries. Valentino Rossi comes in. So it's pretty early to come in. It is a bit, 55 minutes if that for the stint for Valentino. Maximum is 65 but the car a little bit mired down in 19th place, so take the opportunity to put Fred Vavish and Nico Muller in for as long as possible. Yeah, so there is Valentino, so it's been a very disruptive race for the Italian. And he clambers out, and it's going to be a subsequent from Mr. Fred Vavish, who can't recognise who it is getting in. So we understand system. from Gemma that it was a downshift issue for number 32. Audi, so is that a glitch or is that something they're going to have to cope with for the race as bits there again struggles to make the corner goes deep it must have happened again that's part of the answer loses one two three four places this car has a real problem yes and if it is a downshift problem then I mean he's sitting there pulling on the paddles behind the steering wheel and it's not functioning as it ought to do so twice now and again he's having to try and recover but not able to do anything coming into the stadium so Charles Fairs has found himself from being a comfortable, or a relatively comfortable race leader. Let's just stay with him to turn one, listen to what happens when he tries to go down the gears. The problem is it's intermittent, I suspect. I don't think he tried to change down there. He's up to fifth. He's going to have to go down the gears here. It's not going down. He's still saying fifth. He's, he's effectively stuck in a high gear. So Charles Wears has undeniably a gearbox problem. There's another sharp corner coming up. And again, you would expect him to go down through the gears. If he can, he's going to try. Let's listen. Really, really clunky. Again, he's run wide into turn six, not able to slow the car down into third gear yeah. now. But it's just a very, very clunky downshift and probably erratic as well. But he's giving away place after place. They're going to have to do something about that if they can on the pit stops. 32 is effectively out of the hunt now, isn't it? Because he's lost so much ground. And I don't believe it'll be a quick fix. No, it's not a quick fix, and it'll probably be a fix that can only be worked upon in the garage. So other than one of these reset, delete, reset buttons on the dash, which would have control. Now, gear shifts are hydraulically controlled. Is it a hydraulic issue or is it an electronic issue? I'm sure all the WRT team are looking at their onboard computers to get the best information that they can. That when he does come in, they can affect the quickest repair. And Maro Engels lets the back of his Mercedes slide wide in turn 15. But so far, Marcello unable to really challenge. But interest up that one position. Yeah, interestingly, as they've squabbled for a lap, so 
the uh, clean McLaren has got away. This is where it's into the pit lane. Not unexpected, you've got to say. But it could be. This is where the car stays. Chugs down the pit lane. There is Marciello then, chasing after Engel. The Iron Dames Ferrari going a lap down. We've not really touched on uh, Porsche's hopes in this race because the leading Porsche is only down in 14th place and Klaus Backler in it has just pitted. So we have affected a driver change. The car is staying on the pit lane. So whatever the team believe the problem to be, whether they can adjust or make an adjustment on the pit lane, uh, I suspect it's more hydraulics than it is anything else. So when they fire up the car, maybe it will do a, a reboot, but uh, the Brains Trust at WRT will be trying as best it can to get the car back in the race and salvage something out of this. The team manager of number 46 to the stewards regarding contact at turn two. Well, it wasn't at turn two where Valentino had his off on the first lap, so it's a separate incident and the yeah. car is being looked at and Valentino Rossi might be in uh, strife because of it. Turn two incident under investigation. Right, there is Engel versus Marciello. Marciello quickening his pace, isn't he? He's getting closer and more of a threat to Engel all the while now. Yes, in the last few laps, the gap has been closer, but the cars are so equal in performance that there's no advantage to the 88 over the number two. And all you can look and wait for maybe is when you start to get into the, the back markers and you're starting to find compromises. As, well, that was just a little bit. That was Axel yeah. Jeffries getting yeah. a bit uh, ragged. Just looking at the lead car, just being circumspected where he waits to find a way around. So the Mercedes is quick enough in the straight, but down the outside. Now, will Axel Jeffries concede or will Madeo be able to undercut on the exit? Not really. Didn't read that maybe quite as well as he could have done. So he maybe had a, needed to back off a little bit earlier to make that effective undercut more effective itself. So Marciello here still stuck behind the similar Mercedes AMG of the Get Speed team. Engel at the wheel of it. They're third and fourth now. So Marciello, of course, having started the race 14th up into fourth place quite a recovery, hasn't it, as other people have had their problems and uh, pitted. And we are now at the end of the first hour, so pit stops coming thick and fast. Down to the Saxe Curva comes now 112. Maciej Blazic at the wheel of it. That's the second of the JP Motorsports McLarens. The Inception McLaren. Brendan Areeb at the wheel has now taken over the lead of the Gold Cup. There it is in the background, number seven. But that, of course, is partly thanks to an early pit stop by the number 911 Porsche. Brendan Areeb steps over the kerb, gets it back onto the racetrack, and the American driver comes into turn 13, possibly due a pit stop. This lap or the next to give way to uh, Oli Milroy or Frederick Schandorf. So it's going to become a very, very busy pit lane because only a few have made that stop. But the Reeb stays out on track. And so we're now 62 minutes and a bit into this three hour event. So another three minutes for everybody else to decide at what point in there. We see the 32 still there. Number 32 out, you see in the pits, it came back in. Calvin van der Linde took it out, it's come back in, and effectively that's out of the race. Look, they're just pushing it out of the way. Uh, so number 32 Audi is as good as out of the race, which is even more disappointment, especially when they were in the lead before the problem struck. Well, after doing an outstanding job in qualifying to get that full position, and then for the gearbox, or whether it's a hydraulic, because that's what operates the gearbox, um, electronics and hydraulics. So disappointment indeed. And, but the rest of the race is going to be very interesting. Well, it is, isn't it? Because you've got Drudy ahead of Clean that aren't, with respect, normally fighting for race honours. You've got Engel, who's had a lean season, only third. Yeah, but Matteo Drudy's up and gone. He's eight and a half seconds ahead of Christian Clean, who's now got a five, now six cars all behind her, and the race leader has now made it in. So Drudy comes down the pit road. This car that is uh, shared by Christopher Hasser and Luca Giotto. Who do we go for next? Hasser. Yeah. Definitely Hasser. I was going to suggest it would be 
Christopher, because Luca Giotto is probably these days as fast as Drudy, if not faster. And you'd want him uh, in at the, at the end of the race in case there's a, a late race safety car. Now, something uh, has happened to 63, hasn't it? Because Jack Aitken brought the car in and the Lamborghini, the Emil Frey team, has dropped a long, long way down. Also, as you've just seen, is Raffaele Marchiello, but number 63 Lamborghini has lost a massive chunk of time. Albert Costa has taken it out, but a long, long way back now. So he's waiting for the 12 to come off the jacks. The fueling hose still attached. You can't let the car off the jack until there. There we go. So the car, oh, and just look at that. Oh, well, it have got enough room. The camera foreshortened. I thought maybe the, the Lamborghini the 163 might have blocked the number 12 in. So there is a good stop. Look, look at Engel. And we've still looked up directly behind it. We've got the 88. So it was the sister car to the 88. So these cars have come in in position and they're going back out as they came in. Right, so Engel's car now uh, with at the wheel of it Stein Schotthorst stays ahead of 88, which is Danny Junkadea. So I'll give you the order at the end of the next lap. Christian Clean, we expect to give away to Vincent Abril. And 88, Danny Junkadea has fallen a long way back, hasn't he? And also Absolutely. there, 25 has got between them. So they, they came out more or less nose to tail, and suddenly we got an idea in between them, and uh, hard to see why that happened. So Sean Horse has got that comfort zone, but the 25 idea looks like it's all over the back yeah. of the Sean Horse. Number two Mercedes and Junkadella looking to finally get up to speed. Yeah, Christopher Meese is in 25 now. That's the car that is on the tail of Scott Horst. So the McLaren is in. Look, this is going to be a real struggle because Christopher Meese is not going to sit back and, and let that Mercedes get away. He got between the two of them and didn't see where that happened. It happened coming up either into or on the exit of turn two. And Christopher Meese is thinking, I want to get around that number two Mercedes, and if I can do that, I can pull ahead. That's Christian Clean into the pit lane. He had notionally taken over the race lead, but it'll go back the way now of number 12 Audi. James Collado has just come into the pit lane. We'll pick up on 51 Ferrari in that next stint because it's getting itself back into the mix. So the leader goes by, and it will be Luca Giotto shown on the timing screen behind the wheel of number 12. Oh, which... So we were right about that, then, weren't we? Well, I'm surprised if that's true, actually. Danny Juncadella has lost that critical ground on the opening lap to the number two. Christopher Meese giving it up now. Lamborghini, has that just come back out or is that out of position or is that a... So there we watch out of turn three. So Christopher Meese had his opportunity very early. So... What can Meese do is not an awful lot he pulls out but the reality is he's way way too far back and it's only by just really harrowing oh over the curve oh christopher meese that will not have done you already a power of good at all and look behind as the the number seven mclaren rejoins but you've got danny junkadea up the inside of traffic as well so there down to turn eight comes stein scott horse versus christopher meese in the battle that's effectively second and third now as they come towards the stadium behind them. Danny Junkadea trying to wriggle his way up past the Emil Frey Lamborghini there, but for the moment unable so to do because number 14, Stuart White at the wheel of it, keeping him at bay. And this is not a great start for Danny Young. Off the inside, Christopher Meese. Oh, couldn't get any closer without making contact. There was no room up the inside. Mercedes was placed absolutely perfectly to preclude Christopher Meese thinking of that overtake. So over the timing line goes that battle. So it is Luca Giotto, if we believe the timing screen, ahead of Stein Scott Horst, ahead of Christopher Meese here. It's one of the most varied orders we've had for a race leading group. Stuart White going better than ever in fourth place. So here they turn out of turn two. Luca Giotto's number 12 Audi. I'm sure it was Christopher Meese's helmet. Anyway, seven seconds to the good. So the Audi leads. Let's have a look as they come up towards the Spitzkehrer. So there is number 12. That's the leading car. Turns through. There you can see the gap behind. 
which is now Stein's Cockhorse in second place. In third place, it is Christopher Meese. Gap back to fourth, a Lamborghini Stuart White. Fifth, Danny Jokadea. Sixth, Vincent Abril. Seventh, number 66, Marcus Winkelhock. Eighth, a Porsche of Alessio Piccariello. And then in ninth place should be Fred Vervich. And tenth, Cesar Gazzo aboard number 26, Audi. Christopher Meese still trying to work it out, how he can find a way around. Scott Sean Horse in the number two. And the Mercedes has got enough pace to keep it ahead. No doubt if the Audi could find a way around, it would be able to pull away. Um, you can see the differences in lap, a few hundreds of a second in one place, a few thousands elsewhere. The stadium seems to be where Christopher Meese has got a marginal gain over the Mercedes. But then you've got the quicker parts of the racetrack and there's not very much he's able to do. So one car that's done pretty well out of all of this, seemingly, uh, is the number 46 Audi, isn't it? Which is in ninth place now. So despite Valentino Rossi, or possibly because Valentino Rossi pitted early, they managed to jump up to uh, ninth place. There is Fred Vervich going through. So from ninth, and that car is only 14 seconds off the race lead. Vervich and Muller to the end. Yes, Could be uh, on for a good result here. Absolutely. And this I dare say, could this be the WRT team's best opportunity? So, yes. Brent Rubich, um certainly getting performance from the 46 car. We didn't see Valentino illustrate quite so much as Rubich is doing right now. So he's got something to pursue. And he's, what, he's two seconds behind the Porsche in eighth position. So there is Cesar Gazzo, who is second in silver at the moment for the Santa Lock Junior team. The leading silver car. Oops, that's the Mad Panda Mercedes in stride at the Saxe curve. It's going to get going, but that causes others to take avoiding action behind him and around him. And I don't know whether there was fluid or there was something on the circuit. I couldn't quite work out what it is. Yeah. But Mad Panda is going slowly. And whether they've also done a too much damage to the tyres. I think they're coming, yes, they're coming back into the pit lane. So whoever is behind the wheel of the 90, it's Assenheimer. Uh, yeah, Patrick Assenheimer yeah. with a problem. Yep. And he comes. So whatever the cause of the spin is, is maybe related to why he's coming into the pits. Uh, that's why there was contact at Oops. 93, and I thought there was something on the track. There's bodywork between the 93 and the 90, and there may be a little bit of fluid as well. So right now, we are 37 laps into the race and getting a replay of the incident from on board number 93, Mercedes, Chris Froggart at the wheel. So he comes into the stadium. Oh, that's messy. On the, yeah, and he goes to go Porsche around ahead. the outside, but... The Porsche, I think, on the inside tagged him, and that's then where we saw yeah. the contact. And there's the damage to the front of the 93, and that's considerable. So that's the number 90 Mad Panda Mercedes, Mad Panda made, right? yes. and that could well be the end of the race for that car, I fear. So the incident has been noted, but that car with lots of damage to it. Right, this is the fight for second place. Steins Kothorst is four tenths ahead of Christopher Meese. So you take WRT out of the equation, you take one or two others out of the mix, and it's a really different order. Yeah, and this battle for third place, second place, whatever you want to call it, is beginning to claw into the game that Luca Giotto has. It was eight seconds at the point where the car came in. It's down to 6.8 seconds. So the 51 slides through and I wonder what's going through the mind of that crew right now. It's an if and an and a but of what might have yeah. been for the Iron Lynx Ferrari team. It's now a recovery drive for the remaining car. Christopher Meese, well, going to go round the long way round, going into turn one, but up the inside as possible, but it's covered by a shot on horse and Meese again. He's, he's tenacious. Yeah, I mean, this is Christopher Meese's best chance of a good result this season. And he comes then out of turn four on the back of Scott Horst. Up the road ahead is, of course, Giotto. Behind them is Stuart White, who's just dropped off the back of that little group slightly. Fifth is Danny Junkadea. Junkadea's last lap, a 39 7. 
route. He's an OK pace, but he's not really uh, closing. Uh, the reason that Jack Aitken's car, now Albert Costa at the wheel, fell back was they had a refueling issue, trouble connecting the uh, fuel nozzle from the rig, I understand. So in the process of this battle going on for second place, Giotto has actually managed to find a little bit more pace. So maybe the reason the gap came down could have been traffic, we don't know. But it's now just over seven seconds. So he's beginning to move a little bit ahead of the second place battle, and that's just continuing. So, Luca Giotto leads for car collection Audi team, but Calvin van der Linde's WRT car is out of the race. He then is with Gemma. Calvin, really disappointing to see the car here in the garage. What was the problem? Uh, yeah, we had a shifting problem near the end of Charles' stint. Thought we could kind of manage it and it would kind of go away by itself, but it just got worse and worse. And by the end, I was stuck in fifth gear, so I had to bring it home and unfortunately retire, which is a big shame, obviously, after this morning's qualifying, but, um, you know, life goes on. Sadly, it is disappointing, but like you say, it's racing. Yeah, it is. We've got one more endurance round left in Barcelona, so we'll try and end that one on a high to end the season. It's been a tough year, to be honest. A lot of things that haven't gone our way, which is a big shame, you know, with such a great driver lineup, great team behind uh, with Team WRT and really want to end off their, their final chapter with Audi on a high. So uh, let's let's uh, stick together and see if we can do something in Barcelona. Thanks, Calvin. One sprint, one endurance event still to go, both in Spain, Valencia and Barcelona, the destinations for the championship before the end of the season. So an hour and 46 minutes still to run in this race as Luca Giotto is now 6.7 seconds up the road from Stein Scottles, but Stuart White has clawed back all of a sudden that lost ground against Mies. Yeah, Mies has dropped away from the back of the Mercedes, so uh, whether Mies has just been pushing so hard that he's done a little bit of damage to the tyres, of course, running very close on a warm day, but another car doesn't help your temperatures either, so either it's a voluntary drop back to get some more air into the front of the Audi or just simply maybe he's used his tyres. He has been pushing really hard all the way through his stint and maybe he's done a little bit of damage too early and consequently he's paying the price now. So there is number 14, Stuart White, the South African driver, near to Emil Frey racing this year, but doing a great job. Uh, in the past, we saw him in cars that weren't that competitive, so uh, you never really saw the best of him, but uh, you are now, says Agazzo, chasing after him. He's second in the Silver Cup behind Stuart. And third in silver at the moment is Nicholas Scherl. So it's Lamborghini, Audi, Audi. Vincent Abril dropping back as well, number 111. So the McLaren not going as well in stint two as it was at the start of the race in Christian Klein's hands. He's just been passed by Marcus Winkelhock. And Nicholas Scherl goes through there, number 63. Now Albert Costa is up into 12th place in that car. Badly delayed with that fuel drama, the refueling nozzle not not connecting properly in the pit so a lot of time lost at the end of the opening stint they're running behind the bar well Lamborghini out of a different cast but he wants to get ahead of that car got an opportunity up into turn two relatively straightforward is it or not well Albert uh, I think he hesitated he wasn't quite certain whether there was going to be ground given or not but still behind it well I'm slightly surprised at that so Nicholas Schell will have thought that might help me a little bit more well, Stein Scotthorst still chases the race leader, but he is edging away a little bit from Christopher Mies. Now, there the leading Porsche goes through. Alessio Piccariello in seventh place. And there Vich look coming up onto the back of Abril. That McLaren is fading fast. Yeah, that looked good just at the end of the previous lap in the stadium. So that's where Vich again appeared to have the advantage over the JP Motorsports McLaren. You know, you clumber over the curbs and it's, there's a gain for using the curves, but if you use them too aggressively, then you can lose yourself a certain amount of time down into the Sachs curve. So. I mean, it, it, you've, got a, you've got attack and defense within the space of what three car lengths between Avril and Barbiche. So just feathering the throttle, trying not to have to lift off, just to keep the momentum up. So across the line. For the 40th time, 41st time now into turn one. Another whack of the curve yeah. as Babiche turns in, but it's more when rather than if he gets past Vincent Abril, who has lost three places since the start of his stint. And Babiche is right there on his tail looking for a way by into turn two. Back onto the power. But it stretches his legs, the McLaren. Yeah. So all Babiche can do is drive hard as he can, 
and the McLaren just is pulling away. I mean, there's nothing more frustrating to know that you're quicker in a lap. The car you want to overtake has got the advantage of the critical part of this Hockenheim racetrack. And just too much of an advantage coming into the Herbert. But Beach not able to take the chance to throw it down the inside and uh, try and get alongside April and Fred Verbeek down to turn eight then. Breaks as late as he dares. Ahead of them, look, unless you have Picariello in the Porsche. But Abril certainly under attack. And that car at the start of the race was doing uh, lap times about seven tenths quicker than it is now. Now, back into the lead of the Gold Cup is Alfred Renault's Porsche number 911. Ralph Bode led gold early on, pitted early. And so the Dubai 24 hour race winner takes it over. Alfred Renault, twin brother Robert, to do the second stint. So Alfred Renau now into the approach to the stadium. Second in goal, Rahul Frey, you're riding with her, the Swiss racer. And then third in goal, number five, Mercedes, the Haupt car, with Florian Schulter behind the wheel right now. So there is 83. Through turns, Rahul Frey. And just up the road ahead is the Lamborghini. Benjamin Heiters at the wheel of it, the Chilean driver. That is Florian Scholzer, third in the Gold Cup for the Hap Racing Team. Scholzer, an experienced driver, but over the last couple of years, he seems to have found a, a good turn of pace. Well, he'll be focusing on the rear of the Iron Dames Ferrari. Now, number 46 Audi is ninth. Valentino Rossi having done his stint for the day, and Valley is with Gemma. Valley, we saw the early part of the race. You had a bit of a moment. We saw you run wide. What happened? Yeah, the start here uh, was very, very tricky because uh, the track is so narrow. And uh, in, uh, I was uh, very much in the pack, but in the turn three, I think that uh, I can stay on the track, but unfortunately, when I see the track is over, so I did a mistake and I go on the, on the gravel, but it was, was a great shame because I lose 10 position more or less, because we had uh, a good uh, position in the start. Uh, but after, uh, yeah, long, long safety car, was very boring and it was a shame. But after when we restart, uh, I'm quite happy because my pace was good. Uh, I, can, uh, I can recover, I can come back in the, in the pack. So now we can we can fight for the for the top ten. Absolutely, the car's running really well and the strategy seems to be going according to plan. Yes, the the Audi uh, in uh, this weekend was always very strong in this track, and uh, and also the tra the strategy they, they make very good strategy. We can uh, overtake a lot of car in the pit, and uh, now we see. Absolutely, well it's been great to see the car climbing up and up and up throughout the course of the year and see that top 10 position now. Let's hope it continues. Yes, now, now we have uh, Fred in the car and Nico that uh, they are always very strong, so maybe we can make a good result. Thanks, Valley. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you. The nice thing about Valentino Rossi, one of the many nice things about him is that he's honest. He doesn't say somebody pushed me off. He says, I made a mistake and ran out of road. I accept it. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, what one would hope you get from a professional sportsman like Valentino Rossi. But Fred Vavish, in that interview, managed to find a way around Vance and Abril. So he's up now into eighth position, looking at the rear of the Porsche, which is a further two and a half seconds down the road. Christopher Mee seemingly coming back a little bit uh, onto the place, second place, number two, Mercedes. Now, 188, Miguel Ramos, leading Pro-Am, has copped a five-second time penalty at the next pit stop for causing a collision. You're looking back from Danny Junkadea's Mercedes and Marcus Winkelhock, but Miguel Ramos then for Garage 59 on his next pit stop, so that'll be in about 38 minutes' time, we'll have to serve an extra five seconds. And the team managers of number 11 Audi and 27 Lamborghini to the race director immediately, not the stewards, but to the race director as there. Junkadea really hangs it out over the curb. Yeah, but for Danny Junkadella, it's not been the greatest stint. He's got Marcus Winkelhock all over the back of him. So he never really on the point leaving the pits and they allowed Christopher Meese to get between himself and the number two Mercedes AMG GT3. So Junkadella under pressure right now. Marcus Winkelhock, one might not even call him a veteran of GT3 racing, but somebody who's still given the car has got all the tools available to be most effective. 
Uh, Patrick Assenheimer out of the race. Uh, also, as you know, Kelvin van der Linde and Fred Vavish, five second time penalty at the next pit stop as well. So the number 46 Audi, five second penalty at the next pit stop for causing a collision. So you've got one of them for 188, one of them now for 46. That was up at turn two. We didn't see it, but there's this incident that's uh, there from turn two. Miguel Ramos, is uh, Mercedes McLaren, comes through. That has got this five second penalty at the next pit stop. And then, as I say, another one for number 46 Audi with Fred Vervish at the wheel of it. Mm, especially I mean, if you're not the responsible party for a penalty, it's a little bit frustrating, but there we are. Those are the rules and regulations. In the meantime, uh, just looking down at timing and scoring as we look down through the field. Wow. So let's have a look. We're looking at the Audi, I think, number 46, that dives up the inside. And as he comes out of the corner... No, not the Audi. Oh, it's the McLaren that's we're looking at instead, 188. So that's yeah. the Ramos turning around 33, Arnold Robin. In fact, it wasn't. It was Alexander West in the first stint because we'd seen Arnold Robin facing the wrong way early on, and that was when Alexander West was in the car. It's Ramos on the wheel of it now. There it is, but it was Alexander West uh, at the helm. And there's confirmation of the penalty for number 46. Now Vervish behind the wheel of that car. It's all been a bit fractious, this, hasn't it, so far? I mean, it's been... Yeah. It's, it's the nature of the racetrack, one has to say, and the competitiveness of the field. Everybody's been so close together. But you know, your competitors are being almost forced into doing things which might be against the better judgment, but it's the only opportunity they're going to be able to make progress. Well, there is the soon-to-be delayed 188, still leading in Pro-Am. And by enough of a margin, I would have thought that five seconds isn't going to really hurt it. 93 Sky Tempesta Mercedes goes through, delayed after its little contretemps with the Porsche and the Mad Panda Mercedes. Now, there is Stein Scotthorst. He's four seconds back. He's closing on the leader. Some of this might be down to the traffic, but equally, Scotthorst has shaken off Christopher Meese, hasn't he? So he's got away from the uh, blue Audi to a degree. There is Luca Giotto still in the traffic. Yes, and that's going to hurt Giotto because if he can't get round the Sky Tempesta, he's going to look down the inside, but that's been covered and that'll frustrate. Oh, now the Mercedes runs very wide high, so that allows the lead Audi to get through, and that is a little gift for Giotto. We didn't expect that, but maybe, well, whatever. The 93, whether it was an error or whether it was actually the realization that I'm holding up the race leader, doesn't really matter. It allows Giotto to get clear. So how close is Mies? Still eight tenths of a second. It's been a lot less than, than that earlier in the stint, I suspect. The issue is that Mies has pushed so hard on the early part that he's done a, that what's happened to 93. It's slowing right down as it is still going to be back into the pit lane. That looks as if Chris Frogger has got an issue that uh, he needs another pit stop to rectify. It's up to speed, sort of, but yeah. it's, it doesn't look it looks like it's what the walking wounded really more than anything else. Picked up sort of pace, hasn't it? But not enough. So another tough day for Sky Tempesta Racing as Scott Horst second has been caught by Meese. And look, Meese has got Stuart White as his constant shadow. Stuart oh so close, but not quite able to find a way through. And that's been the story of this battle for in effect second place. And Stuart White joining in to make it a three-way battle. So who's got the advantage? I suspect arguably Stuart White has because he's been able to run at his own pace to catch this group of two cars battling for second position and not having to be compromised in the process. So Stuart White might have the overall pace advantage over both the second and third place cars. So second, third, fourth down to the sax curve. Behind them in fifth, but not really closing, is Danny Junkadea. Again, the car just doesn't seem to have quite the get up and go, certainly compared to the get speed car, the number two entry in second place of Stan Scott Horse. Stuart White, though, Hat tip to him because this is undeniably the best that we have seen out of him, and he's really taking the battle to, of course, a former endurance champion in Christopher Meese. Yeah, that Christopher Meese, well, he doesn't really want to have another car behind him, but the fact is he's got a car behind him which I think is arguably quicker than the uh, 25 RD Chris Me Christopher Meese behind the wheel. So it has been a great run by Stuart White to get himself up to position. So right now we're on lap number 48, and there heading towards us number seven, which is Ollie Milroy, fourth in the Gold Cup. Now, 
that car was leading the, or, or well up in the class early on, wasn't it? Didn't quite take over the lead in the hands of Brandon Derry, but it was there or thereabouts. They, I think, have lost out on the pit stops. They certainly seem to have dropped back relative to the Porsche. That might be, though, because the Porsche uh, stopped early and it played into its hands. Number five, which is Hubert Hout, player manager for the Hap Racing team, team owner, driver, massively experienced, the German driver, comes across the timing line, down now towards turn one. Sorry, Florian Schultz at the wheel of the car. Forgive me, it was Hout in the first stint, wasn't it? Schultz was taking it over, uh, and that's 26th overall, chasing the McLaren. So that is for third and fourth in class as they come up now towards turn two. He's at Tutumlu Lothes in the Lamborghini is behind them. But the McLaren, now, I think Oli Milroy, you would anticipate, in fairness to Oli, to get away. His last lap was a 1 minute 40.3, 1.4 seconds quicker than Schultz. So, yeah, Oli Milroy, another underrated British driver, getting away from Florian Schultz. So, the inception racing McLaren, looked after by Bass Linders, comes then up towards the hairpin, leader through. Yes, he is. And. Again, that. Catch, been caught in traffic. Oh, be so careful, be so careful. Look at the auto. You get yourself into the danger zone by too many cars around and not enough racetrack to allow them space to work. Christopher Meese was a second down a lap ago. He's now three quarters of a second. So Meese seems to seesaw uh, between a second and just under a second. So down the inside for Giotto finally gets ahead of the Ferrari. And he can now breathe a little bit as the second and third and fourth come through almost as one out of turn six. But Scott Horse being caught again by Christopher Meese. Uh, top speed at turn 12, which is the first corner into the stadium. Albert Costa, the bravest. Arthur Rougier, then Baptiste Moulin, 164 plays 162 kilometers an hour. That's, that's traveling. And three Lamborghini drivers then showing the top speeds. This is turn 12 as Stein Scott Horse goes through it. He's fourth in that speed trap at 161 kilometers an hour. Charles Wirtz was tying with him, but of course that car is out of the race. So that is the race vision powered by AWS Graphic giving us the data. And if you go to GT World Challenge Europe's website, you'll be able to find uh, a link if you go to this event, then to the uh, dashboard there to more race vision by AWS data so you can choose which car which class which corner what you want to look at there's a whole lot more via the championships website as again through traffic goes Giotto gets up the inside of the Porsche there blasts his way past Alex Malikin and puts a lap on him to further extend the margin over Stein Scotthorst yeah clean pass by Giotto and needed again clear that traffic very quickly because the second and third place Mies trying to go around the outside gets onto the dirty part of the exit of turn two and will fall back and of course that'll put him straight back into the arms of Stuart White in the fourth place Lamborghini. So where is this group of cars? It's difficult to see them as they all come down into turn two. So there is the pink and white Mercedes, the blue Audi, and then the blue and white Lamborghini. So Scott Hall's through, dodging around the traffic again. Gets up the inside of the Pro-Am Ferrari there, as Christopher Meese does not do so. So he's slightly delayed into turn seven. Stuart White doesn't capitalise. Meese gets through the traffic now, up on the inside there. But White does go through. They're hanging about. Yeah, good driving from the Ferrari to let those cars go through. So nobody really gained or lost in that. I think the one that was concerned was Christopher Meese. Again, coming into the stadium, all of a sudden, you've got traffic, and there's nowhere really other than you take a chance down the inside. Will the Porsche concede? Yes, it does. So again, Christopher Meese is looking to slip up the inside and get past. So does Stuart White. So really, this group of cars for second place have done very well in the traffic in the stadium. So I think maybe Steinhorst was hoping that that door would have been closed and give him a little bit of breathing space. But second, third, and fourth come across the line, more or less, as they've been over the last so lap, number of laps. So Stein Scott Horse then goes through 2.3 seconds back from Luca Giotto, but that lead gap very much affected by the traffic right now. There is the second place car, the Mercedes, third, the Blue Audi, fourth, the Lamborghini, and then fifth now is Marcus Winkelhock. He's got ahead of Danny Junker there, so change for fifth. Ex-Grand Prix racer Marcus Winkelhock ahead of Danny Junker there. 
more evidence were you to require it that that Mercedes just hasn't got the pace this weekend? Seemed to have more pace with Marcello behind the wheel, but maybe that was due to the track position that that car started, yeah. but now you're getting into this lapping of cars and maybe he just took it at it it's not the pace where it matters for him to get through i mean basically he's coming into turn six you'd think you get all your overtakes done and he is struggling with that group of cars to find any way to get around it so down towards turn eight the porsche backs out of it so don't forget that behind junker there is alessio piccariello and behind piccariello is verviche great little battle pack building up here I, I have a fear that that Mercedes is going to drop more before the end of the race because it's it's got no response, has it, to the Audi. Look what Winkelhock has pulled in less than a lap. I think they're looking at dropping further as well because the Porsche are following and Fred Verbeesch, again, looking at every opportunity to find a way around. To make, I mean, the pace the 46 has shown here this afternoon, very good indeed. Fred Verbeesch doing an excellent job for the 46 team. Indeed so. So through the turn 16 exit they come. Right, so there is Juncadea, he is sixth. Picariello in the green Porsche is seventh. Eighth now is Verviche. That is Marcus Winkelhock for the Attempto team. He's up to fifth and he's charging. And he's on a message, I can assure you. Riding the curb like that on turn one, that's Marcus Winkelhock at his best. So you're looking back here from Juncadea. And that is Winkelhock behind. And look, out of the last corner, from nowhere, the Audi appears. And look, it's like Junker Dea has got the handbrake on him. He's frustrated, hand off the wheel. He can just do nothing about it. No, I mean, the pace of the Audi through those final two turns was way quicker than that of the Mercedes. So whether that's a grip problem that the Mercedes has got, that's all it can be, because those two corners are not necessarily power-related. That's got to be down to the handling of the car, the level of grip that Junker Dea has got to deal with. And it hasn't been sufficient to keep Marcus Winkel not just up behind him, but now he's ahead of the idiot Mercedes. He's pulling away. I can't believe it's the BOP if number two is going so well, but 88 is just dropping, dropping, dropping. Uh, there is the race leader. Scott Hall's trying to get through the traffic behind. Can't do it as yet. And uh, Junker Dea, look, there in the background, comes towards us, but Picariello is right there behind. So in the space of a lap, Winkelhock had passed the Mercedes are pulled away by 1.8 seconds. Now, that ain't good. That is definitely not good for 88, and there's got to be something wrong with this car. It's been lethargic, for want of a better word, through qualifying and in the race thus far. We've tipped over the halfway mark, but again, Junker there comes out of turn 16. It might have a problem that they're trying to nurse and drive round, but it seems to be there in qualifying anyway. 60 is, Picariello 7th in the background, looking at the green Porsche. And Albert Costa is up to ninth after that slow pit stop. Now, I mean, it's in the stadium that we see on Godella, particularly in turn 15 and 16. That's where Marcus Finkelhock took lumps out of him. So now he's having to defend in sixth position. And he's got Picarello in the Porsche for Biche in the 46 Audi. There is Verbiche going to go one way, side three cars almost abreast. So Verbiche, who's going to come out of this on top? Looks like Verbiche may have done enough down into the braking Christopher Meese all over the back of the number two so where has the performance from the number two gone all of a sudden that looks like it's lost as mojo and you're right Vervish has gone past the Porsche yes. so Junker Day offends them off for now but Fred Vervish now up into seventh place at the expense of Alessio Picariello and I think it might soon be sixth because Vervish yeah. and Ardis we saw Winkelhock how quick he was in the stadium Verbeesh has been picked all around the lap and he just needs to get onto the tail of the 88 Mercedes and I suspect it'll be a similar overtake to that we saw um, a few minutes earlier when Junkadilla lost that position to Winkelhock. Yeah, I think you're right. I don't think it's going to be much defence from Junkadilla because he just hasn't got the pace to defend. Uh, Oli Milroy has got up uh, with Benjamin Heites ahead of Rahel Frey. So that puts Oli Milroy's McLaren second now in the Gold Cup. Uh, 51, Miguel Molina, the Iron Link surviving Ferrari. Arguably the wrong one survived, but it's in now 22nd place outright. And the gap over the line between Danny Junker there and now Fred Verviche as they come through is confirmed at 11 tenths of a second. I mean, it's just bad all around the racetrack. It is. So the race leader goes through. Look how close Christopher Meese is now to the tail. And Stuart White likewise. So 
the gap at one point had opened up to over a second between second and third positions. Again, it's closing down to barely an immeasurable amount of time. And Luke Stewart White, the third of those three cars, is the one who's gaining the most. So Mies has got to go to defence him to keep the Lamborghini to his left as they come in. And again, Mies almost into the back of the Mercedes. Stuart White's trying to find a way, jockeying for position as they come out of turn six. So as the Carl's come down to turn eight, we understand from Gemma in the pitch, he's got hold of Raffaele Marcello, but Raffaele says we're not aware of any problem. We'll have to ask Danny at the end of the stint what's going on. But uh, if they do know, they're not for telling. They're going to make uh, Danny Junkadea speak for himself. I, I can't believe it's that Danny isn't quick, because he is. And he's pressing on as best he can. But, you know, Danny Junkadea is doing what he can. Uh, Marcello didn't storm up the order too greatly. No, but all I can suggest is that Junkadea has not got either balance in the car or got grip in the car, because it's here that certainly we've seen. When Mar Marcus Winkelhock came and called him, he just went round. I mean, literally, he was about 10 kilometres an hour quicker on the exit of turn 16 than we saw Junkadella. So now, look at this. Oh, Christopher Mies getting very racy again. Watch him on the inside, rides the curb. The, the one to watch for me is Winkelhock. Look, because there he is, right on the back of Stuart White. And Marcus Winkelhock, a bit like Stuart, a bit like Christopher Mies, is having the race of the season up towards turn two. So although Luca Giotto is now four and a half seconds to the good, this battle pack for second is now four strong and it's got Winkelhock at the back of it and he's on absolutely on a mission. Now let's see what he can do about this Lamborghini. We're on lap 55 up to the Spitzkara. He's had a few laps in his own, on his own in clear air to catch up to the back of Stuart White. But the usual story, you can catch, but once you get into the slipstream, you're dictated by the pace of the car in front of you. You cannot do very much more, so you either catch and pass in one move or you have to be patient and look around. Maybe traffic is going to be the best key for Winkelhock to find a way around Stuart White, if that opportunity even arises. Down to turn eight, they come. Second, third, fourth, fifth, all bunching up. And then for six, the Junker there, a second ahead of the Vigi. It only came down by a tenth, actually. It didn't come down by that much. Certainly not in the way that uh, Winkelhock came storming along, caught past, pulled away. There is the Audi number 66 then. Marcus Winkelhock having uh, taken the car over from Kim Lewis Ram, Dennis Marshall still to go. On and the inside, goes done the it. Mercedes, yeah, that's it. Mies has done it. Finally, he forces the error out of Stein's Scott Horse. And, and now the, Stuart White dives out the inside of the Lamborghini, but he can't go through. But watch Winkelhock, he will be looking to see. And he tries to get alongside the Lamborghini inside turn 16. Stuart White just had the momentum to shut the door, but that all kicked off with that one manoeuvre at the exit of the Sachs curve. We almost had two passes from two different little micro battles going on overall for second place. And that pressure that Christopher Meese has been ladling on to Stein Scott Horse finally tells it was a tiny error, but significant because Meese finally is through. And now look, release, look at the gap he's pulling. No, no surprise whatsoever. Now wait and see what happens. Is this going to be important? for Stuart White and for Marcus Finkelock. Well, they've got to close that gap down. So Scott, Scott Scheinhorst is going to be thinking, what happened there? How did I let that situation arise? But simply just maybe again, it's the overall degree of grip. Again, running deep and wide into turn six, and that's again giving Stuart White indication that possibly an overtake might be possible. So what is currently fourth place for Stuart White? Well, we could be third. Well, now, Christopher Meese a little bit stuck in the traffic. There is Marcus Finkelhock, then right up behind Stuart White. Marcus, much more experienced a driver, but Stuart White defending well. Yeah, watch Winkelhock in those final two turns, because I think he enjoyed that overtake that we saw a few laps earlier. And I think he might think I can do the same thing again with the Lamborghini. He nearly made it work one lap ago. And I think that's going to be an opportunity he's going to try and develop. He needs to be a little bit closer to the Lamborghini coming into these final two corners. But he did previously have very good speed all the way through. Oh, dear, be very careful, Christopher Mies. And he's a large space, and the Mercedes has allowed him to run through. That's going to be a frustration now for Stuart White, because he's going to be delayed coming into turn one. Sebastian Bode at the wheel of that Mercedes. Goes a lap down. Stuart White now tries to attack, getting a replay here of the mistake from Scott Horse. Too quick into the sax curve. Yeah, it was just a breakaway there into turn two. There was possibly going to be a bit of action. 
from Marcus Finkelhock. And again, you can see just once you make a mistake and you get compromised, and that's what allowed Marcus Finkelhock to get so close to the back of the Lamborghini. So here we are back one lap later. Oh, there's a replay of what was going on from a different angle. Yeah, that's the one we saw at the time, wasn't it? With yeah. Scott was just going a little bit high around the corner. So there through is 99. That's the Nicholas Sherl Audi that's currently running in 12th place, third of the Silvers. Stuart White versus Marcus Finkelhock. Finkelhock to the outside line at seven, the inside. Great oh, Stuart White oh, sideways. Oh, Finkelhock oh. goes right round the outside. Great save from Stuart White. Good break pass by Finkelhock. And look, Junker there is back at the races, and so is Vavish. That was unbelievable. The Lamborghini was on the lock stop, trying to keep itself from spinning around. And what a pass by Marcus Finkelhock. Real racing pedigree from. Marcus Finkelhock there. Another car that's fading. I know we're looking at a great battle, but 1-1-1, Vincent Abril, the car that was in second place before the pit stops, is way, way back in 10th now. So something has gone wrong for the JP McLaren. But there, Stuart White, now with Junker Dale behind him. And Marcus, uh, not Marcus Finkelhock, Fred Vavish right on the rear of Junker Dale. So he's now got to think about, well, is Fred Vavish going to give me the same kind of hip and shoulder or whatever? to make a further progress for the 46 and knock the 88 back a further position. That will put it back into seventh position overall. What a poor race they're having. Let's watch again and look how sideways is the lap oh. again. I mean, it was just a bit of skating and ice. Inches apart, Finkelhock held his nerve and went through. This is how it all started, coming out of the Schmitzkera. Stuart White on the inside, and as he turned in, Finkelhock sort of had the racing line. White's car from that angle just looks like a twitch, but from the other shot, it was a proper, proper slide. I tell you what, from the cockpit, it wasn't comfortable either. <laughs> so just to go back to my Vincent Abril point, the 1-1-1 McLaren has dropped back into 10th place. Uh, oddly, Jean Cadea, Yes, OK, I know they've been squabbling and that's delayed them. He's come back at Stuart White that way, but he's been able to repel Vervish. And for, now he looks comfortable again. For the moment. Yeah, true. I, I don't know what you could do. I mean, clearly tyres can't go through cycles where they do recover or they certainly stabilise. I can't think of any other obvious reason. So who is chasing Sean Orser? Still Marcus Finkelhoff, 2.3 seconds behind. So there is the Mercedes, there is the Audi, and there we go, Fred Vavish, who bringing up in seventh position. So the Porsche not hasn't the Porsche hasn't lost contact. I mean, it's still there or thereabouts. Oh, who went, was that? That was Lopez. He's at Tutumlu Lopez at the Sax Curva, off through the gravel. He's back onto the circuit. 88, Danny Junker there. Then sixth comes out of the Sud Curva, and here, look, Vavish has not been able to make a proper move against him. There is number 51. I was mentioning earlier that Miguel Molina was soldiering on. The car is a bit battle-scarred after its clash with its teammate, remember, from early on in the race. But Miguel Molina, James Collado finishing the first stint, giving the car over to the Spanish driver. And it's up now into 20th place overall. What could have been? Yeah, exactly. For both what cars. What could have been yeah. for both cars? Uh, Molina's next target is 159. That is Manuel Maldonado. Now British... Uh, National, British driver, coming up through Sudkurva, but Miguel Molina, the former Audi DTM racer, right up behind him. Over the timing line, they go. 19th and 20th, they run. Axel Jeffries behind then, and there is in 21st place now uh, Alfred Renauer. He is leading the Gold Cup still, as Molina makes his move, and he goes through on the inside line, now 18th. Yeah, I mean, relatively unchallenged uh, from the McLaren, so uh, the 51 Ferrari had inherently more pace. So it's, uh, you, you, you fight your particular battles, and that's a different class battle. So Marcus Finkelhock closing, closing, closing. Gap was 2.2 seconds. I'm sorry, it was about nine tenths of a second last time through. Looks like it might be about half of that. Again, it's this section of track where Finkelhock, I think, has been particularly strong. So how much can he run down the Mercedes AMG GT3 as they come out of the exit turn 16? Nine tenths of a second. Uh, it's probably not a lot different than reality. And for the time and come up. That's actually oh. quite a lot. It's about two tenths. So yeah. But again, will he make a move down the inside into turn two too far back? So just sit back, get your exit out of turn two, get the run 
off the corner, sit in the rear wing of the Mercedes, and then hopefully dive down the inside. Danny Junkadea has finally succumbed. He's down in eighth place, so you've got Vervish sixth, Picariello seventh, and this was how Vervish made his move, totally committed, down to turn eight. Oops, bit of contact, and that falls Junkadea out wide, and that's why uh, also Picariello was able to get past. Yeah, I just wonder whether that pass will be allowed to be just declared a racing incident because Fred Verbeek really was not alongside uh, Junker Della when he made the move. He tipped the, right, the left rear of the Mercedes, which sent it off to the right. So it'll be looked at and probably go down as a racing incident between two professional drivers rather than an AM and a pro driver. But again, Winklehock all yeah. over the back of the number two. I don't know, sorry, number three. Number two. Number two, yeah. I know, you're going to be two and three on the screen. Third place, but number two, Mercedes. Now, Christopher Meese is catching Giotto. For the last two laps, he's lapped quicker, and he's brought the gap from four and a half to 3.1 seconds, so it's coming down. Stuart White, fifth, has dropped away a little bit. Sixth there, you saw Vervish going through. Best we've seen out of number 46 all season. Nico Muller still to come. Don't forget, we're about 12 minutes or so away from the second final round of scheduled pit stops, and then it's that one-hour blast to the flag. So a fresh driver in the car, Tank of fuel, stick of tyres, go to the end. So, again, Winklehock looking beyond the Mercedes to see traffic whereabouts. Is it where will we catch that traffic? That's my obvious greatest hopes because Short Horse is basically consolidating his position right now in third place. And even though Winklehock is, again, quicker overall in a lap, he hasn't got enough pace where it counts to find a clean way through. And here it is done through turns four and five. It's closing marginally, but again, is he going to be brave and go down the one side of his main defence? Goes deeper, deeper. Can he go around the outside? He's trying, but makes the undercut, surely. No. Yeah. Mercedes forces the Audi out wide, and that's not great exit for Winklehock, but that was his best chance, really, so far, to find a way around the number two Mercedes. The fastest driver in the top six on the previous lap was Fred Vervish. So as Winkelhock challenges Scott Horst and is being held up, so White is coming back at the pair of them and Vervish hurtling along behind. So there we've got a slow car. It's a McLaren, isn't it? Is that yeah, 188 is. or 159? Very slow, flash of the lights from Alessio Picariello who squeezes round and Junker there is compromised. Oh, dear it's 188, it's Matt, no. 188 is Miguel Ramos, ignore the Maldonado caption, it is 188, it's clearly got a problem, but Miguel Ramos is in the middle of the road. Yeah, I mean, he's just wandering all over the place, so now they're staying one side of the track or another, but don't meander down the middle like a Sunday afternoon walk because you're delaying other people who are involved in races, and they don't know where you're going, to, what you're going to do or where you're going to go. It's almost like he's concentrating on the dials and uh, therefore paying attention to try and get the car kick started he's limping into the pit lane he's lost the lead of pro-am because now stefano constantini's ferrari you've just seen go past him and here scott horse and winkelock still tied together up at turn two and white has caught them yes but again this is going to be another opportunity for winkelock it's going to be a big defense from the mercedes the relative to one lap ago he's a little bit closer and he is closing yet again so once the mercedes go to the right of the tractor defend then Winkelhock goes to the left to try and overtake, but again, he's found himself in the same situation, and he will be forced wide by the Mercedes, and again, well, not quite so much, but maybe, maybe he's got enough off the turn, maybe he's got the momentum to sweep around the front into turn seven, side by side, and he's on the inside, oh, and off the racetrack, and he's lost it. Well, he'll not be happy about that. But he's not done yet, look, because he tries to get up the inside coming out of turn eight. Finkelhock likes that outside line at turn seven. It worked against Stuart White, didn't work against Scott Horse. Good defence. But look, now White and Vervisha right there behind. Finkelhock dives to the in. No, he wasn't close enough. Thought about the inside line, but as much as that shows his nose, it makes sure that Stuart White can't find a way through into turn 12. Vervisha looking menacing at the back of this group, though. Yes, uh, I think that was a move more. In, uh, oh, up wide. Scott Horse has done it again. He's made a mistake at the Sachs Curva and he's thrown away, what, three places? Absolutely. So what caused that? Was he too late on brakes? Did he not have enough turning, not bite on the turning? All of a sudden, the balance of the car just went all over the place and immediately Winkelhoff, uh, uh, short wide, and then Fred Rubich all through. But watch, here we go again. This is the beginning of what occurred. 
So uh, almost, I mean, see how much ahead he is coming through turn seven and then runs wide and the Mercedes gets back in front. Then the undercut is being prepared by first, uh, by Verstappen, for Vich and by Winkelhoff. All the W's and V's. Yellow flag, sector two, number eight has got a problem. And so Fred Vavish has also got past Stuart White. So the race order now, Giotto Mies, the gap is right down to 2.7 seconds. Finkelhock is third, fourth is Fred Vavish, fifth is Stuart White, sixth just, signs Horse, and seventh there is Alessio Picariello. Yeah, you're not meant to be overtaking. In a, so there's the green flag indicating the end of that zone. Car stop just to the left. Yeah, number eight it is then, so... Who did we put into that? Mike Parisi, it is, at the wheel. Mike Parisi out of the race. Big wobble from Picariello. Turn seven is being attacked even more, isn't it? The commitment level's going up and up and up in this battle. So Scott Horst, then two mistakes at turn 13. And this is that error. John, talk us through this one. So into the stadium, what does he do? He gets on the brakes, but he doesn't slip the car down. He runs way, way high. Problem of going high is you're going to open the door to your competitors, but that's the dirtier part of the racetrack. So his tires are now clogged with whatever would be at the top, and he's under pressure once more from Picarillo in the Porsche. So he's cleaned up the tires in the space of that last lap, but that was an error just simply buying a little bit. Either the brake pedal is going away, the brakes are not giving him the bite he needs, or the tires haven't got the grip he needs under braking. Whatever the cause is, he ran wide, and then all of a sudden, Vinkerlock. Uh, Stuart White, Bavish, and now Bavish ahead of Stuart White. Uh, Picariello, I think, is going to gain a place before the end of his stint. So, six minutes or so before the end of the hour. Albert Costa has just been in, incidentally, but stayed behind the wheel of the car. I thought he was in early. And there, look, Bavish comes up to lap number 112, McLaren. Gets slightly compromised out of turn four, but 63 Lamborghini fades again. And look at the pace of the McLaren has gone. So Fred Vavish is sitting there, having done a good job to get himself up into fourth position. So he goes down the inside because he's gonna, he can break that a little bit later. Followed through by Stuart White. So I don't think Stuart White is going to give up on that battle for fourth no. place. Now, ideally, Vavish needs to get away from the traffic because, remember, that car's got about five seconds penalty to serve on its next pit stop. This is how Vavish got ahead of Stuart White. It was a big send up the inside at turn two relatively easy that yes it was and Stuart White saw him coming and didn't go aggressive and try to stop him thinking maybe Vavish will overrun on the exit but he didn't Vavish got the speed down had the bite and is able to then reset going through turn three so Stuart White did the right thing but in, in, in consequence his hope to get back at uh, the 46 RD didn't come off and look the Porsche all over the back of the number two Mercedes into once again Sachs curve that was the place where all of a sudden three places were lost by Scott Steinhorst. So doesn't want to repeat that mistake and uh, open up another opportunity for a car behind to get ahead. And into the pit lane was that 88 in the background. Danny Junkadeo, I think it was, because 88 comes steaming down the pit road. Yep, there it is. So Danny Junkadeo's mystery stint in terms of the lack of pace comes to an end. The uh, Curtis ASP team is at pit in, so very quickly the car is there. Jules Gounon gets in, Danny Junker there gets out. We are fascinated to know what was going on with that car, or perhaps more to the point, what was not going on with it, as to why it looked so slow relative to the expected pace. It never looked quick from the minute it left the pit lane with Danny Junker behind the wheel, and we don't know whether that was an issue of, you know, Danny was not comfortable with the car, or there was an issue which we will maybe find out a bit later. That's your lead gap now. It has come down to 1.9 seconds. Bearing in mind, this was 4.7 at one point during the stint. Christopher Meese aims to complete this on a high, doesn't he, by getting as close to the back of Giotto as he can. No traffic in the way. The pit lane is getting busy. In has come 77 from Barwell. The Lamborghini also in 9.11. Go would, on, John. would you bring the 25 in earlier than later to try and use that early pit stop to get back out again and uh, have the, the number 12 wait that a little bit longer so this is where black team orange strategy. flag to car 31 uh, rear wing is loose uh, black and orange mechanical warning flag to number 31 uh, loose rear wing you just heard the race director say uh, yes i would bring it in it is coming it in. is coming in because niederhauser is quicker than me these days so you want niederhauser in for as long as you can well tell you, that's a big statement oh, that's a go. big statement Come david I would, I would walk up to christopher reese and say <laughs> my mate says that your <laughs> mate's bigger than you well, let's see, let's see, <laughs> let's see. Let's have a look. So, uh, Christopher Meese is in. 
at Carl's at a 139.017, but Patrick Niederhauser ready to get on board. Not saying Chris Vavici is yes, slow. Yes, Vavici in as well. Yeah, Vavici is in. I think Niederhauser is the quicker of the two these days. Uh, Nico Muller will take over from Vavici. There you've got Lukas Stoltz taking over from Stein Scott Horst. Gunon has already been put into 88, so it is Giotto to Winkelhock now. Six and a half seconds between those two. That is Nico Muller getting into the car. Got as far as GP3 in single seaters before heading to DTM and GT racing with alacrity. You've got the dynamic Porsche in there. Goes Niederhauser. And gets right ahead of the number two Mercedes comfortably. It's still up on his axle stand, so that's a big save, and if you like, for the 25, and there's a Number two still up, just comes off now. So Lucas Stolz will be going back out, but he's got a lot of work to do to get on terms of the 25. Now and the Porsche gets ahead of the number two as well. And look at 46, having to serve the extra five seconds. So Nico Muller drops right back to where the car was initially. Vervich picked them all off. Through goes one of the Akurdis ASP Mercedes. Is that Gunon? I think it is. So Jules Gunon, yes, he's alongside there, coming up towards turn two, and he goes ahead. The Mercedes gets back ahead of the Porsche, scrabbles into the corner. So Gunon has suddenly bought back places. He's back ahead of the Porsche, back ahead of Stolt, back ahead of uh, Nico Muller. Into the pits comes the race leader, Luca Giotto, after a great stint. And we have to wait and see whether this car will return to the circuit effectively in the lead or will be the 25 or... But Niederhauser most likely is the bigger challenger. Just waiting to see Stuart White is still out on track. Marcus Winkelhock is in the pits as well. Indeed, so there is 66 then. So Vinky gives way. So the driver change facilitated, new tyres go on. It's a busy pit lane there, you can see. Now, would you say Dennis Marshall is quicker than Marcus Winkelhock? Yes, because that's why he's been left to the end. You need your quickest driver in for the last stint. That's why I was suggesting about Gunon and, and March Yellow early on and how the balance has shifted there. Niederhauser up behind number seven, McLaren, not for position, but he can't be delayed by a tenth. He's got to get on with the job. It does, certainly does, and it does not need the McLaren, which will be quick in a straight line. As you know, he needs to find a way around the car McLaren as quickly as possible because where is the number 12? There it is rolling, coming towards the end of the pit lane and is about to rejoin the track just as the... McLaren, but more crucially, so side by side. And he's going to be Niederhauser for the lead. He's done it. Great job. So through goes Niederhauser, and Christopher Hauser is going to be in second place. And Patrick Niederhauser straight away finds himself in the lead of the race. Hauser almost getting roughed up a little bit there by being forced out wide, and he can't clear the McLaren, can he? No, and the McLaren's quicker down the straight. You can see all of a sudden Christopher Hauser does not need to have the McLaren getting between him and the race leader. The gap was about two seconds, and now he's going nuts on them. Mm. But finally, finally, the deal is done. So really nothing gained or lost by either the 25 or the 12. But heart concerns for <laughs> Christopher House are thinking, oh, no, I can't do anything with this car in a straight line. So Patrick Niederhauser leads then. So on the pit stops, they've jumped ahead of number 12. So after the hour that Giotto led for, one pit stop and they lose out. Car collection by Trezor dropped behind Santalock. Now we also need to factor in, of course, where uh, the number 66 Audi is going to be. That car having been taken over by Dennis Marshall. But Niederhauser ain't hanging about. Christopher Hauser can smell a good result coming out of this as well. So uh, great to see. Now where, again, we'll know at the end of the lap where they come across the line for the corrected order. We need to see... Uh, where Jules Gounon is, because I think he's fallen back behind 54 Picariello, hasn't he? He was ahead out of the pits, but the Porsche is clear now. It's not Picariello anymore either, it no. says so on the Lumi rank, uh, but it should now be Matteo Cairoli in that car. So that wouldn't be no easy task for Jules Gounon to find a way around the Porsche as uh, we come down and we're going on to lap 68. Indeed so. Right, so you've got Niederhauser leading from Hauser. Third is Dennis Marshall. Fourth is Matteo Cairoli. Fifth is Gounon. And sixth is Stoltz. And seventh is Nico Muller. And Christopher Hauser, first sector purple. So Christopher Hauser knows he's got a chance to win this race, but he's going to have his hands full. Oh, what's that smoke in the pit lane? Yeah, that's the 11 Audi, isn't it? But uh, it's just been brought in. So that's the second. Well, very smoky yeah. Audi going out of the pits. Second of the car collection 
cars. So it rejoins the race. Thierry Vermeulen in number 11. And the smoke looks, is still there. Yeah, they said whether that's from the motor or whether that's from oil or fluid getting onto the exhaust system. So we understand it might be a, a, a hot brake issue for number 11 Audi. Now, right now, with a pit stop owed, Stuart White leads the race, number 14, but he's, as I say, due a pit stop. Nicholas Sherl is second and also due a stop. And Dan Harper, we've not really talked about BMW in this race, they've just not been anywhere, but he's third, but again, due for the pits. Yes, and Dan Harper in the 50 Audi, or sorry, 50% BMW is the lead BMW, is looking down purple. Sector times for Merkov Bortolotti. He's taken over the delayed 63 and has been released. Still the fastest lap of the race. Uh, huh, I'll start the sentence, uh, Kelvin Van der Charles Weir still had it. By the end of the sentence, Dennis Marshall has the fastest lap. So that answers one question. Yeah, first flying lap, Dennis Marshall. Yeah. He nails it. Fastest lap of the race. Pretty impressive. So you asked me whether I thought he was quicker than... Marcus Winkelock, and I said yes. Thank you, Dennis, for backing me up because there he is. Now you're on board with Jules Gounon, and he is hustling along behind Matteo Cairoli in the Porsche. But that's where he's been. He hasn't made an inch on the Porsche no. in reality. So the performance of the 88 car in the hands of Marcello, where well, we thought that was it was able to keep uh, equal pace to that of the number two Mercedes AMG GT3. But once we got into the second stint, Giuccadella just seemed to be unable to make progress, and all around him seemed to be able to overtake him. Mirko Bortolotti, fastest lap of the race now. So uh, the race coming alive, isn't it, in terms of the fastest laps and fastest sectors. We've still got some more pit stops due. Ignore pick on the front of the Lumirank display on the Porsche. There it is, Kai. Matteo Cairoli now behind the wheel, but the transponder is having a glitch, sending the wrong information to both the timing screens and the Lumirank display, but it is Cairoli ahead of Gounon, ahead there are Stoltz. Yes, yeah, so Stoltz is closing down on Gounon. Uh, what a busy race this has been. And once we got over that 30-minute yeah. safety car inter intervention at the very, very beginning, just you know, wherever you look, there's cars racing. Which is great to see, and as you've been talking about the nature of this racetrack, it's given us things that other venues don't. Yeah, and that was the whole, the purpose of designing or redesigning Hockenheim was to make it a shorter circuit, make it a stadium circuit in effect, but also to make it a circuit that would encourage motor racing. And we've had motor racing in plenty here this afternoon. So over the timing line there goes Lucas Stoltz up through turn one. You can see Jules Gounon getting out of the draft of Matteo Cairoli. Now, OK, that Mercedes hasn't looked sparkling today. The Porsche hasn't exactly set the world alight either. So uh, this is, in a sense, the best of the rest battle, but there's no suggestion that that Porsche is leaps and bounds quicker than the Mercedes right now. Equally, it's able to hold its position because the 88 has not been able to make any inroads into the performance of the Porsche, so those two brands are running more or less. I don't think if one was ahead of the other, they would pull away. I mean, the Porsche hasn't pulled away from the Mercedes, and I suspect if the 88 got ahead of the Porsche, it probably wouldn't pull away significantly either. So it's really been very much a Lamborghini initially, but certainly a, a Lamborghini RD day. And uh, Nicholas Schull is just looking to see where all that is. Patrick Niederhauser currently in fourth position, waiting for the final rounds of pit stops to be complete. Yeah, indeed so. So right now, the leader is Stuart White and going quite a long way before he gives number 14 over to Mick Vishofer. That'll be a test of Mick, won't it, to see if he can keep the car in that leading group. He may have to grow up this afternoon. Yeah, true enough. Number 10 just through shot, which is now Adam Eteki, who was quick yesterday in the wet session we had. Nicholas Sherl brings 99 in for its last stop. And that is uh, going to put Alex Arca behind the wheel of it. Mario Zug having started. And remember that, of course, is yet another in the silver fight. Number 30 Audi in the silver fight has not uh, been uh, really that rapid today either. Right, so we just had Patrick Niederhauser through. Uh, we've done 70 laps, and the car's best lap was done on lap 70. So can I now legitimately say that, yes, Niederhauser is quicker than Christopher Meese? It all depends on where he was on the track at the time he did the lap, oh, on his new set of tyres, and, 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 and. 
but Prof. I will say Prof. Niederhauser has done a great job, but even quicker as Merkel Porto Lotti. So, I mean, okay, different cars, nevertheless. And also, Christopher Hauser is chipping away at Patrick Niederhauser. So last time around, uh, Niederhauser's lap was a 138.5 and a 38.6 from Hauser. But this lap, uh, he's looking good in the sector. So this is your lead battle with 52 minutes to go. Patrick Niederhauser versus Christopher Hauser. Well, Hauser has had many an endurance win. Niederhauser, from memory, has not. And what a battle. Yeah, who would you put your money on, youth or experience? And right now... I have to go for youth because Christopher Hauser is caught, but the battle will be how will he find a way around Niederhauser if he gets sufficiently close? Yeah. The 50 is in, so the BMW junior driver teams there making their last round of pit stops. Good drive by Dan Harper uh, to get that car okay this, because of the overlap of the pit stops. Nevertheless, they've been the junior team doing a very strong job. So Stuart White stays out getting to the end of a stint. He's done now 63 minutes. You're only allowed to do 65, so he's got to be in this time. That's 159 Manuel Maldonado in. So that car to be given to the very rapid Dean McDonald. And that car ninth when it came in, as you can see, the Emil Frey team getting ready for number 14. There it is, into the pit lane. So Stuart White, when he gets to the timing line, will have done 63 and a half minutes, give or take. Slows the car down, gets to pit him, 63 minutes and 30 seconds. Would one say that by the stint of Stuart White's life? Yeah, so absolutely. Far in his yeah. involvement in, in this series. No, he's a, a good guy, Stuart White, and that is the best we've seen of him. And he's risen to the occasion. He's done a really, really good job. And now, as I say, Mick Vishofer has got to carry on the good work. But yeah. Uh, brilliant effort by Stuart White. Doesn't know the circuit. He's new to the team and the car this year. He's relatively new still to European racing. Logan As there, through, yep, goes Lucas Schultz. In trouble, 88 is in trouble. Slows down, doesn't it? Gunnar has got a problem. It's still going, but the pit lane looms. So through has gone Lucas Stolt. That puts the car up into seventh. And Jules Gunnar, yeah, again, still going, picking up pace again. Yeah, but suddenly he just lost all yeah, momentum. I agree. What, what's going on? Staying out. Stays out. So Gemma hopefully will hot foot it to the Akurdis ASP garage for us as number 14 Lamborghini is about to rejoin. Through goes Cairoli, through goes Stoltz, through goes Gunnar. That Lamborghini is dropping down the order now. So it's fallen to the back of the queue. Unfortunately, it's lost out now. And Nicomolo likewise also yeah. going to be close to the back of the... Well, got us currently seventh or eighth position. Just one car between them. So Nicomolo will be fancying another step up the ladder. So that pit stop was 66 seconds. It's a little bit slower than some, but not calamitously slow, but it has come out behind. That said, you've got faster drivers into these cars sooner. So that's why they've been able to buy back the time because their lap times have been uh, considerably quicker. Whereas number 14, the better lap time of the car was done early on in the race in the stint uh, done by Constant Apollina. And even though Stuart White did a great job, because he was mired in traffic, his lap times weren't as good as they were from Lapaline and earlier in the race. So there's your leader, that's Niederhauser, and that's Christopher Hauser in second place. And I've got a feeling that gap's just creeping up a bit now. I think just coming out of turn six, Christopher Hauser ran a little bit too wide, ran the curves, the car snapped back to the middle of the racetrack. So maybe that's where that couple of tenths of a second advantage may appear is a visual not a timing and scoring one so i think you may well be right those little errors if they do start to creep in and need a you can keep it clean will pay dividends for the 25 id so there is patrick niederhauser taking over from christopher meese dennis marshall in third now the gap between Hauser and Marshall is 4.6 seconds and Dennis Marshall was a thousandth of a second slower in terms of the best lap time and was two tenths quicker uh, on that last lap. In the turn seven speed, which is coming at the end of the next straight out of the hairpin into the next right-hander, uh, Machis Blazek, surprisingly, is the fastest. Well, he's been quickest in a number of sectors as well. So where the pace comes from from the McLaren, oh, oh, almost getting a bit tight there and that's going to give a bit of a wake-up call because I think Niederhauser is going to be slightly compromised with these two cars directly ahead. They're probably having their own inter-class battle. And unless they can find a clean option 
I think you're going to see Christopher Hauser all over the back of Patrick Niederhauser. Pat Niederhauser. I think you're right. So the gap coming down between that top two. And Jules Gounod dropping back uh, after losing that place to Lucas Stoltz. They are remaining tight lipped despite Gemma's charms. Uh, so that's almost an acceptance and an admittance that there is a problem because they don't want to talk about anything. I think it's understandable, but of course we would like to know what the issues may be. But clearly it's just confirmation of what we've really been seeing really throughout the start, middle and now final sector of this race. That 88 car has been off colour yeah. all weekend. With it's the exception of Saturday free practice. It's, it's like he's got the lurgy in some way. It's just not been there, has it? Uh, Lethargic, I think was the word we used earlier on. There over the timing line, Dennis Marshall. Now that lap was the 38.9. He is lapping quicker than the two ahead of him. So Dennis Marshall, again, he knows this place really well, using the track knowledge to good effect. And of course, he's in clear air. Yeah. So he's not having to make compromises or adjustments to find a way of past some of these lap cars. He will do very shortly as the leader in the second place get clear and uh, they then uh, charge further up the racetrack. There's more cars you can see all the way down into turn six foot, four more cars that they will be catching. Probably in the beginning of those four or five cars will be by the end of the slap. And again, look how close Christopher Hauser can draw himself to the back of the leader. Runs again slightly wider than I think he should be doing on the exit of turn six. And there the gap you see marginally extends again. So Patrick Niederhauser doing a very intelligent job as well as a very fast job so Hauser with all his experience is having to use that to keep in contact and Niederhauser has got the marginal advantage of not being under that kind of pressure so down to turn 12 46 minutes of the race remain there are the leading cars Niederhauser last time half a second ahead of Hauser there is now in number 14 uh, Mick Vishofer still leading Silver, which in a sense is the main aim. They're ninth, they've just fallen back behind triple one. Dennis Lynn getting the McLaren back into the uh, races here, but Vishofer leading his class. And number 30 Audi is only fourth in class. Again, that Audi has had an anonymous day. It's not been an Audi, certainly a WRT day, has it? No, they've had a, a disappointing day. And that's the understatement of probably along with, with the 88 Mercedes, two of the principal teams have had really bad days. And um, just looking to see where the 88 will. Jules Gounod is in sixth position, so he will score points against the 71 Ferrari, which was taken out effectively once the race got restarted after that long safety car intervention. So while it's a, a not a great day for 88, it's better than that for the 71 Arnings Ferrari team. Yeah, it's been damage limitation, really, for the Mercedes, but, as you rightly say, they have at least got the opportunity to score, whereas the number 71 Ferrari was done and dusted after 14 laps, and most of those have been behind the safety car. Through goes number 26. This is Nicholas Bart running third in the Silver Cup, and Mirko Bortolotti is up into 12th place overall, still absolutely hammering along in the number 63 Lamborghini. That is the Gold Cup leading Robert Renauer. And that car's just had a really good, solid day. We talk about others not delivering. This has ticked every box. It's been quick, reliable, kept out of strife, consistent, you name it. Under the radar. Yeah. And that's all you're required to do. You're racing in your class. It's one thing, the glory of leading a race or being in contention to lead a race. But here, there are four separate classes, and that's what the Renard Porsche is here to do, win the gold class. So as the leaders go, through to start lap 76. The lead gap is up to six tenths of a second. That is Ollie Milroy going oh, through. way wide. S yeah, second in gold cup. Uh, also now Frederick Shandor for the wheel of the car. This is third in gold, Alessandro Balzan, number 21 Ferrari. Now, where's the next car of note going to be? Nico Muller, let's see. He is actually not as quick as Jules Gounon. Whatever that glitch was, Jules seems to have got it sorted out or can drive around it for the moment. Balzan goes through. The car is 22nd overall. This is the now Pro-Am leading Ferrari of Andrea Bertolini. And it's, uh, trying to work out what the 88's problems are. We heard at the start of the race, it's going to be hard on tyres, it's hard on brakes. Mm. You know, it's that simply what it is that the, the brake pedal in some instances, because we saw Guno, suddenly all of us, the gap just opened up. Where did that come from? And I don't know, I could second guess. And if the team isn't prepared to give us an insight into what their issues are, 
Well, that's what we were left to do, a second guess. Indeed so. Now, this car is second in Pro-Am. Dominic Bauman, as you'd anticipate, was the quickest of the three drivers, given driving duties to the end. And Enrique Chavez in 188. That car has rejoined, albeit a couple of laps lost, whatever the Garage 59 issue was. We haven't got to the bottom of that, sadly, but the car is still circulating and therefore, crucially, scoring points. Bauman turns through very, very rapid from his days of ADAC GT Masters. And there's the leader, and yes, Niederhauser will be clear by over a second this time. Hauser is just dropping away a fraction each lap, and it's all adding up. It is, so up next will be the Iron Dames for race leader Patrick Niederhauser. And you can see Dennis Marshall, look at the gaps he's taking out of second place Christopher Hauser, so it's not going to be too long before we see the number 66 there. It comes into view now. So taking substantial half a second, half a second, a tenth of a second over the last three laps. That's massive to take that amount of time out of the second place. Christopher Hauser driven Audi. Well, Hauser has done that car's best lap. Niederhauser has done his car's best lap. All the best laps in the leading cars, the leading what? Six coming from the current driver. So Gunon's best lap is the best of 88. Stoltz has done number two's best lap. Uh, Matteo Cairoli has done the best lap in number 54. And Dennis Marshall is still lapping about a tenth a lap quicker than Hazard. Partly, I suspect, this is down to traffic, as there are the leaders stuck in slower cars right now. But Dennis Marshall has an opportunity to buy back a little bit more time here. They're very dirty on the exit of turn six. That also is a, something that drivers have to factor in when they come into turn seven, but principally into turn eight, that the tyres maybe picked up some of that dust and maybe the braking efficiency not quite as good as you'd expect it to be. So. Nothing really open, oh, well, a lot of smoke somewhere. So there, 46, Nico Muller. Now he's slightly out of sequence here, look, because between him and Gunon is the number 10 Audi that is a lap down. So that is Adam Mateki, who's a quick driver, but Nico Muller is not racing him. He wants to get up and race that Mercedes, but Gunon for the moment has cleared him. Now, white flag, that's a slow moving car. Who is that? It 51. is 51. That's a puncture. The left rear puncture, yeah. So we saw puffs of smoke, and I don't know whether that one was driven onto the gravel now to get out of the way, which That's is very considerate, but... Um, Nicholas Nielsen is the yeah. driver, incidentally. Uh, whether he drove there out of consideration or because the thing wouldn't turn, dis discuss, but he was in the gravel, certainly, and Nicholas Nielsen is limping yes, to the so pit lane. the left rear tire's gone down. So I don't think that was the cause of him running wide. I think he intentionally ran wide, but maybe... It, but but wider than anticipated so crawling back with a left rear tire deflated smoke pouring i mean that is going to be a right mess hopefully hopefully it's not going to catch fire uh before it gets to a stop at the pit lane so the day of woe for iron links continues and there nico muller is still stuck behind adam Atecki. they're waiting for moving but again there aren't any blue flags that i can see well, adam Atecki was blindingly quick yeah. in the wet on saturday morning so he thinks well if you can get past me you get past me on merit I'm here to do the best I can for the boots and racing team, and uh, I'm not about to give up that, if that give you that pace. Look at that. What a, well, hopefully, hopefully the damage is just restricted to the tire, maybe the rim, bit of bodywork rub as well. So in it comes. Look at the rim. Well, there's not a lot of energy going on there. No, I think that car, because it's so far down anyway, might well now be retired, but we will see. Now, look, Niederhauser has cleared the traffic, and he's got two back markers between himself and Hazza. He's been on his toes through the traffic. Michel Gatting tries to find a way past the Porsche ahead, but to no avail. And these two cars are in the way of Christopher Hazza. Yeah, and Christopher Hazza sitting there, and the Ferrari's on one part of the racetrack, Porsche on the other, and he will come off the final turn quicker than probably one or both of them. But how is he going to find a way through? Because the Ferrari is looking to find a way around the Porsche, and the straight line performance of all three cars is probably pretty much identical. Best chance is going to be up into turn two. So that gap is up to 1.7 seconds. Hauser is stuck. He was stuck at turn 16, at turn one, and still at turn two. Well, that is real hard luck for a good look at behind Dennis Marshall. And he's running down just 1.5 seconds behind. The second place, Christopher Hauser, and he's got all the motivation, momentum behind him. And again, 
Hassa aren't able to do anything for yeah. the two back markers directly ahead of them. Now, of course, in the cars, as there to the inside line dives Michel Gatti to clear the Porsche. In the cars, there is the marshalling system, so hopefully blue flag signals will be in the cars to the drivers, but there's nothing around the racetrack to tell the Porsche nor the Ferrari Marshall to get out of the way. Yeah. right on the tail now of Christopher Hassa. But where's the blue flag? Finally, Hauser has to dive, and he doesn't. He shouldn't have to dive to get through a back marker. Gets past the Ferrari, but Dennis Marshall again gets crowded, goes round the outside. He's done it, but again, it was all a bit risky. And the Ferrari is trying to come back because Marshall was compromised on his exit. Now the Ferrari all over the back of Dennis Marshall momentarily, let's just say. And so now Hauser clean, makes clear. his move through on the inside. Yeah, gets ahead of the Porsche, and that is off the road. Valente. Hugo Vallon, yeah, in the number 11. That's the other car collection car at turn one. And he's gone a long, long way off, all over the runoff tarmac and into the gravel and the tyres. That could see a full course yellow. And it's a long way away from the racetrack. But if, if that car can get there, then others likewise. But to retrieve that car, I think, let's look at oh, the cameraman. Well, we saw the tail end of the spin. He must have lost it or contact. Maybe that car also going back on track. Maybe there was contact. Yeah. So yellow's at turn one as... Five, four, yeah, three, yellow. Two, yellow. two, one. Full course yellow now. Right, so everybody slows under a full course yellow. Just under 37 minutes of the race to go. I might sit down for a moment now. Uh, it's been a dramatic old race, hasn't it? <laughs> it's been non-stop. <laughs> I haven't even had a chance to take a drink of my energy drink to keep me going. Oh, so you don't need an energy drink, John, clearly. Right. Uh, so we'll let John refuel. And uh, there are the cars then under the full course yellow procedure, making the run now up to uh, Spitzkera. So re remember, this isn't the safety car. This is a full course yellow to slow everybody down, get the field under control, and then the race director will be able to coordinate the recovery of that car. It may be that we have to go safety car, given the length of the recovery process, and then to speed people up ready for the resumption of the race. There is Christopher Meese. <laughs> Just musing on the fact that Patrick Niederhauser is a Nats quicker these days. Lucas Legere had a good first stint in that car, and there they are as the race leaders. The and now that's 3.3 seconds to the good. Oh, dear me, I thought about catching your breath. <laughs> I mean, the competitors need to catch their breath. What about us? How was your energy drink? Uh, I've hit the spot, oh, definitely. I've about that. Right, uh, there's the safety car It's been sitting there all race, waiting for the opportunity, <laughs> but there's been a precious few of those. This car is in a difficult situation because it's up against the tower bales on the one hand, and, of course, it's buried in the gravel on the other hand, so it's going to need an external extraction vehicle to get it cleared. So... Oh, another five or ten minutes to sit down and have another little sip. Well, there is the race leading car then, Patrick Niederhauser, doing a, a very good job, as you would anticipate, for the uh, Santa Lop team, for Sebastian Schottau's team. Patrick Niederhauser, the uh, German GT champion back in 2019. So, again, he'll know this circuit. First came to prominence winning in Formula Abarth in Italy way, way back in 2011. But... Uh, Got as far as GP3 before switching codes, if you like, going into GT cars. And not only does he lead, not only does he have 3.3 seconds in hand, but he has also now started to use the traffic to his advantage because he's got uh, certainly one back mark between him and Christopher Hauser. I don't think there's any more than that for the moment. So there, the VSC, which is the Formula One equivalent of FCY board being shown, but you know what the drill is, it's a full course yellow. I think uh, it, says, it says F, full course yellow on one side. Right. <laughs> so they've got one board for two tasks. Hedging bets. Uh, incident between number 11 and 77 noted. Now, 77 is Patrick Cuyula in the Barwell Lamborghini. So you talked about another car. There being was another car, I think it was a Lambo. Yeah. So I suspect that that was the, the cause of the Audi being out of the tail end of the spin. Yeah. There was contact at the point of entry. Oh, a door being taken away as well. That's interesting. Is that a souvenir or is that just something that would be handed back to the team? Well, can't find a car yet, but it's, uh, I think, been lifted. So that's an Audi door. Yes. It might, have been, it might be the driver's door because that was uh. the side up against the tire. But we don't know. It's just speculation. So the car is being slowly but safely removed. Always interesting to see where the centre of gravity is when a car is up like that. 
there's the bar yeah, well. The bar well yes, it was. Yeah. Yeah. So it hit a, a reasonable old rattle. It was having to then clamber across from the inside with all the gubbins that's yeah, inside. Of it was not the easiest thing to do. So we've got safety car. So the pace quickens, as you can see, and this is ready for the resumption of the race. So safety car procedure now. And of course, what this does serve is that the gaps come down. The gaps come down, but there's more congestion because everybody's behind everybody else. Yeah. So you won't have your momentum to get past a slower car quite so easily. So you've got to rebuild that and hope that those that are ahead of you that are slower out of category or out of position will be generous. So there's one car between first and second, and then you've got in fourth place, uh, for third place, Dennis Marshall. So, Santa Lock Audi heads car collection by Trezor Audi, heads Attempto Audi, and the fourth placed Audi, seventh overall, is your best WRT car. And of course, if WRT, as we uh, now have learned, will be moving on to run BMWs next year, there's, if you like, a vacancy to be the favoured Audi GT3 team, and this is a pretty good audition. Well, there's, I'm sure there are a few candidates that might step forward, and right now, car collection and. Uh, is that Santa Lock. Santa Lock. And Two, also yes. Attempto. Attempto, yeah, yeah. Three, yeah, they're all doing great jobs. Indeed so. RD1, 2 and 3. And I don't think any of us would have said at the start of this race we'd have expected to see an RD1, 2, 3 in the final hour. Safety and you might say the highest place WRT Audi would be the number 46 entry. That might have surprised people as well. Let's hear from Christopher Meese then. His car's second. Pretty good for you guys as we stand at the moment. Coming out to the other safety car, it's been a very eventful race. Yeah, like expected, you know, Hockenheim is a tough track for everyone, even for the drivers, so um, it's going well so far, but we've still got half an hour to go and uh, it's going to be interesting. Confident that you can maintain that position? I hope. It looks like we have a strong pace. Uh, we had a good pace even in the, in the second stint as well. I think a couple more left that I could have catched the, the guys in front, but uh, yeah. For the moment, looking good, but we all know how motorsport goes sometimes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, Christopher Meese, who's won pretty much everything there is to win in a GT3 car, whether it's championships, whether it's individual races like the Bathurst 12 hours, the Nürburgring 24 hours. His CV doesn't lack much. I like the way he adds in. I've had a couple more laps. I could have probably, yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> racing drivers, you can never put them down. So we are behind the safety car just while the pace quickens, ready for the resumption of the race. The field turning then up out of turn eight. Which we only see Christopher Meeks really in the uh, endurance rounds these days, but uh, it was a good pace and it's brought the car very much into contention. Lights out on the safety car, so we should be able to go racing this time. So there, Patrick Niederhauser is going to have just under half an hour of racing to go. Now, Christopher Hauser has got to clear the one back marker after the timing line. So he's got to hope that that Lamborghini is on its toes and follows Patrick Niederhauser pretty much pace for pace here. Otherwise, Hauser's going to be delayed. And then Dennis Marshall is right up behind him. In fourth, it is Matteo Cairoli's Porsche. They accelerate now and away sprints Niederhauser. But watch Dennis Marshall, because I think he is the one that's going to on this Green group flag, of cars. green flag. He will be the one looking to make that surprise move on Christopher Hauser, but not close enough coming through those final two turns. Hauser's done well, but look at the pace of the Lamborghini, out of position, yeah. but as quick as anything in a straight line. Absolutely right, then it's Hauser in second place, third is Marshall. Gap back, because in fourth you've got Matteo Cairoli under attack from Lucas Stoltz then, so the pink Mercedes is on a mission as well here. Look at the traffic jam coming out of turn one. The Porsche goes defensive against the Mercedes. Hauser clears the traffic. Dennis Marshall tries to get through as well. Can't do it there. But they'll make the undercut. But again, the straight line performance. Both got similar power units, basically much the same cars. But the speed of the Lamborghini, I mean, OK, we're all racing. But sometimes you have to be aware of other cars around you are in the principal race for the race lead. And now Niederhauser's gotten clear and followed through. 
Now look at this for the players. Look at this, because it is just Cairoli keeping at bay. Stoltz, Gunon is in that mix as well. And so is Muller, and so is Lind. Here they come towards us, and who's going to win out of all of this? I think it is Nico Muller who's gone ahead of Gunon around the outside. Let's wait for the next shot. Yes, 46 has gone ahead of 88, so uh, Muller gets ahead of Gunon. Dennis Lind in the McLaren there. Look, he's on the tail of Jules Gunon now. This could elbow back the Mercedes, and of course, every place lost, points lost. Absolutely. So very, very tight in this group of cars. So where is, there's Nico Muller in, currently in seventh place, Dennis Lind behind Gunnar. So just wait to see when they come across to our finish line, how all this will unfold. So right now, Nico Muller is the, but he's somehow or other, he's got Ryan Gunnar. I don't know whether that happened, we didn't see that. Oh, it's coming out of the hairpin, okay. it's all in that big right. scrub. So over the line goes second and third. Hauser versus Dennis Marshall. Christopher Hauser, two and a half seconds back from the race lead. I reckon Nieder Hauser has gone now. It's going to be hard for Hauser to make that up, especially if he's got to defend. And the main advantage of Marshall, uh, that Nita really House has, he's got clear air. He's running on his own. There's nobody he's going to catch for another maybe eight or ten laps. And well, nearly by the end of the race, look at the field coming up out of turn one into turn two. It is horrendous. And I tell you, somebody else is on a mission too. That's Mirko Bortolotti. He's in tenth place now, and he's caught up to this Hofer in the same team, Emil Frey racing car, different class car, but Borsalotti should be able to clear him. And bearing in mind, Mirko has done the fastest lap of the race. There's more to come as now. Dennis Marshall tries to seize the opportunity coming out of the hairpin. Almost level, almost level. He's got the inside line for turn seven. Dennis Marshall to the inside. Hauser on the outside line. Toe to toe they go, side by side. Hauser over the curb, runs wide. Inside line for turn eight. Back through he goes, goes wide. Dennis Marshall not able to pounce there. No, but he had a better exit, so he's going to have a better run out of turn 11 down into the entry into the stadium. But Christopher Haas has just done enough to consolidate that, that, that big challenge that came to him from Dennis Marshall. Now down into the Saks curve. Two competitive cars are not going to make it right. If two go in together, only one's going to come out. They go in in single file, so no change. In the meantime, Niederhaus is up and running. It was 2.5 seconds. One lap down, wait to see what that gap's going to be when they come up to the end of that 85. Got a bat marker going rally crossing in the middle of the stadium, but it doesn't affect the leaders as the Audi 1, 2, 3 continues. Niederhauser is now, what, ahead of the opposition. Three seconds, and it's four tenths between Hauser and there, Marshall. Fourth is still Cairoli in fifth place, Stoltz. Sixth is Muller. Dennis Lind is up to seventh. He's cleared Gunon now. So Jules Gunon back down to eighth in class. That safety car has done him no favours. He's in danger of slipping out of the points or scoring as little as one point. There's only Bortolotti and Max Hesse behind that could move ahead of him and push him out of the points. He's eighth at the moment, so uh, Gunon is in jeopardy of scoring really badly, if in doubt of scoring at all. Well, it would be a tragedy if they didn't score, but um, that's motor race, and there was no, no gifts whatsoever. Way wide. There's just so much congestion coming into turn six that you're almost left with no choice but to run way, way wide on the exit. So second and third through now turn. Christopher Hauser, Dennis Marshall for fourth place. It is Matteo Cairoli. Now, what about Lucas Stoltz behind him? He was lapping slower. Nico Muller, however, is quicker than anybody ahead of him. Now, again, that's still a, a bit traffic affected, uh, but Nico Muller showing good pace. So can we get number 46 any higher than its sixth place before the end? not easy given how competitive they are four Audis in the top six four different teams running them as well well a big turnaround on what was maybe the the form book we didn't anticipate we thought maybe the 32 Audi would walk away with it but that was in trouble relatively early on with some gear issues Christopher Hauser using every inch of the racetrack to keep ahead of Denham Marshall so as long as he can run at this pace it's going to be tough for Marshall to find a way around. And because they've just returned from a full course yellow and safety car intervention, there's no back markers to assist Marshall or even to, to help uh, Christopher Hauser. So there, Lucas Stoltz under attack from Nico Muller. You're on board with Muller now, out of two, through three. Road opens up here. Turn four is the next section. And through the parabolica towards the Spitzkehr of the hairpin, that is Niederhauser away and gone, disappeared up the road for second place. Marshall again crawling all over the back of 
Christopher Hauser, but it is in fourth place Matteo Cairoli who is trying to catch them, but he's actually dropping away because he's stuck in traffic. So what a, what a battle going on. Second and third with the Iron Dames Ferrari in that middle group guard. So that means that fourth place Cairoli is going to have to find a way around that. But he wants to get onto the tail of the third place RD, and that is there's two cars in fact between himself and the back of this car, the 66 RD. And 23 minutes are on the clock, and a flying lap at the moment is a 1 minute 39, 1 minute 40 area. So through over the kerb, Christopher Hauser looks like he's going to have to settle for second place here, but he's still being chased hard by Dennis Marshall. And what about Muller versus Stoltz then for fifth place? At the moment, it is the Mercedes ahead. Uh, Muller being given a hard time also by Dennis Lynn's uh, McLaren in seventh. As onto the pit straight comes second and third. There they are over the timing line. Again, the balance of performance is such that Dennis Marshall not staying on the tail of Christopher Hauser. That margin is half a second, which sounds like nothing at all, but you can see what the, the gap is. Uh, Dennis Marshall is too far back to have a dive. Oh, no, there's no way he could have been more than a couple of car lengths behind. And because they're identical cars, they've got more or less identical performance. But here's a position that is up for, certainly up for, up for bids. So can Nico Muller get onto the tail of the number two Mercedes AMG GT3 and slingshot himself down into turn six? Now the Mercedes is going to go from left across to the right of the racetrack to defend the entry into turn six. Well, he doesn't this time. He thinks he's far enough ahead to not require that. But oh, up the inside, Nico Muller. Well, again, it was a look as to distraction to keep Lucas Stoltz on his toes. So the next opportunity has come into turn eight. And look at Lind on the back of Muller now. I said he was getting closer. There's the evidence. He's right there on the tail now of Nico Muller. That uh, green Lamborghini, of course, is a lap down and not necessarily helping the situation. And Gounon has dropped to 20th. Jules Gounon is 20th. He's out of the points. So the championship leading car has got a problem. He has not yet made it through the first sector on the next lap, so somewhere is 88 Mercedes with a big, big problem. Well, it's 87, that's the sister car. So we haven't seen the reason why Gunnar has just suddenly evaporated. I mean, what a, what a race of stories and fortunes and misfortunes. I think he stopped out on the circuit. There's a yellow flag in sector two, and that's got to be for Gunnar somewhere. So we'll try and keep an eye out for the car on this next lap as the leaders go through. But, yeah, this is... An absolute godsend for Iron Links, isn't it? They don't score, but nor does the championship rival car. What a wonderful finale for <laughs> Barcelona in, what, three weeks time? Absolutely. Four weeks time. So the leaders storm through, 3.3 seconds. Niederhauser is getting away all the time. And there, going through, Tommaso Mosca, 16th place. And Gunon is yet to come by. The car's got to be stranded. Yeah, it is. It's out on the circuit in Sector 2 somewhere. So we'll try and find it. As you see there, number 31, Audi, bouncing over the kerb. Another of the WRT cars. This is the Spitzkehrer. Up the inside! There is the Mercedes, but the 46 Muller has gone through. No, he hasn't. He got alongside, but he suddenly lost it on the exit. Now, if number 88 is on the circuit, that's going to have to be a full course yellow, surely. They're giving him time to try to restart it, but there, that's the story of 88's race. It has ground to a halt, and Jules Gunon is powerless to get it started. And in a, not a good place, that car. So where... Let's see, 46, what's happened to the number two? There it is. There it is. So all of a sudden, there was a pass by the 46, down in turn six, but again, because of track position, now... Nick Miller has to be very careful because directly behind Dennis Lind is looking for any opportunity. Nick Miller made the move, I think momentarily got ahead of the two Mercedes, but didn't make it work. I'm surprised we're not under a full course yellow because if Gunon can't get the car started and it's on the tarmac, then and that is Lind running wide out of the last corner, bounces back onto the road, doesn't lose a place, but he does lose a length or two to Muller. Well, that's the reason we've not gone full course yellow. There's no need the car is able to be extracted under a yellow flag, so the race continues. That's the reason it was uh, with the, the quick deployment of the intervention vehicle. The race continues, but out of the race with 18 minutes to go is number uh, 88 out of the way. Also, of course, given that we'd had that earlier safety car, there was enough space, clear road, clear time to get people out there, move the car. So the race continues unaffected. 
Oh, but what a race, as you say, story <laughs> upon story. It's just an old stop. I mean, we've got, we started with 49 cars, and we've got, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven cars out, and it's still manic all the way through the field. Well, we're not done yet. There is a Porsche slow. And through turn, the race leaders then were on lap 90. So there is number two, Lucas Stoltz, being chased by Muller, being chased by Lind. He's been a very firm no comment, we understand, from a Codis ASP. If Gemma can't charm them, nobody can. So uh, we'll have to try and find out post-race before we are next with you from Valencia for the sprint round as to exactly what the travails were. But it is a mega story. The two championship cars failed to score through separate incidents. And as does the, the principal RD, the WRT number 32, yeah. it fails to finish as well. And it gives, dare we we'll call them the underdogs, uh, some of the less favoured cars maybe, a chance to shine. And Patrick Niederhauser is doing just that because he now leads by 2.9 seconds. 17 minutes are on the clock. Hauser is second, then it's Marshall, then Matteo Cairoli. Stoltz has got away from Muller, Muller has got away from Lind. And Bortolotti a second and a half away from Max Vishofer in ninth now, Alex Arker is tenth. Number 14, Lamborghini. Uh, Mick Vishofer still leading in silver from Alex Arker, from Nicholas Barr. So again, the WRT Championship leading silver car is only fourth in the points. Well, 17 minutes remaining, and it's still as, well, other than the top three, first to second's got a nice bit of breathing space, second to third, well, half a second or so. And then there's a further 3.2 seconds back to the fourth place Porsche. Oh, eight goes around. So that is Loris Cabiru, and that's up at turn two. two. Fortunately, it's sufficiently off racetrack that I don't think that's going to be an issue to recover that car. Nevertheless, it's got a, a yellow flag in that sector, so everybody is aware they can't overtake in that sector if they thought there was an opportunity. So as the dust settles, so the Lamborghini tries to rejoin. How did it get there? Was there any contact? No, just completely wrong under brake. Something grabbed, pitched it to the left, and around it went. I think he may have had a wheel over the curb. Mm. Just very, very sudden snap oversteer, and he's out of the car. Maybe something more serious that he's decided. Uh, you can see the marks on the track. Yeah. There's certainly whether it locked up or something. I mean, it and that's your turn. Bunon trudging back. That is a picture that tells a story, isn't it? You don't need a thousand words to tell that story, that is for sure. No, indeed. So, Jules Gounon out of the race, and no points then for Akodis ASP. The car was fading in Junkadea's stint, and it is out of the race in Gounon's. Quarter of an hour to go. Niederhauser, race leader, 2.9 seconds. Last time around was the margin and Dennis Marshall. Now, who's that coming into the pit lane? Dennis Lind with a problem. Oh. Dennis Lind, who was running in uh, seventh place, comes into the pits slowly. So up the car goes. Oh. And, oh, they're going to go to the garage, so the car has got a terminal problem. And that is a sad end for a great run by the, the 111. JP Motorsports, but Dennis Lind gets out to Sconson Lee and walks away. So... So late in the race, I mean, what now, 14 and a half minutes to go. And you've done all the hard yards, the car's been performing well. So Nico Muller back at you know, within closing distance right now. So the gap was one second the last time around. It's probably much the same. So as the cars now work lap 92, order shuffled again. That brings Mirko Bortolotti into eighth place overall as uh, there Nico Muller runs it wide over the kerb. But up front, Patrick Niederhauser delivering a very, very impressive stint, isn't he now? Controlling the pace up front, and there in sixth position is uh, Nico Muller. I think I'm right in saying this is going to give Valentino Rossi his best result of the season, as there, the gap's right down again, second to third. Dennis Marshall having another, another push here, just has a breather for a couple of laps, gets lots of clear air into the car, and it's the tyres recover, and now he's on a charge. Yeah, Marshall was less aggressive on the exit. He's going to try and make that undercut. So this is the best opportunity in a long time that Marshall has had to find a way past the number 12. Hardy and he's in the draft. Doesn't matter about the headlights flashing, now it's not going to affect Christopher Hasse. So Hasse again using the middle of the racetrack to dissuade Marshall from going one way or the other, forcing him to take the long way around. 
and can he sweep around the outside and make it stick? Yes, he has. He's just more grip, more bite, and, and it doesn't look the rear of the 12. It looks, I thought, slightly as if it was down on the right rear, maybe just in an optical. So that was a relatively easy pass, but it all set up from the exit of turn one and executed into turn six. And it also has suggested now that Marshall is going to be able to get away and therefore can Matteo Cairoli close on Hauser before the end. 13 minutes to go. Three and a half seconds was Niederhauser to Hauser last time, but that again could well come down. And now that Dennis Marshall is up in a second place. So as the leaders come into the stadium once again, there's your Stolz versus Muller fight for fifth position. And ahead, Hauser's got a problem. He has that a problem. Audi is fading, fading, fading. I think it's a puncture. I saw something that looked slightly, I thought the left rear of the car, was, well, which was, well, he's staying hard, whatever the problem is, he's decided not to come in and Can't he's turn. got a problem. Can't uh, turn. That was a mistake not to come in. So Chris Reinker of Audi Sport looks on, but yeah, you're right, Hauser should have pitted because now he's going to do a full lap. That car's effectively out of it, we can ignore it. Number 12, limps off the circuit. They're still recovering up at turn two, so the order now. Niederhauser five seconds ahead of Dennis Marshall. Cairoli is third, Stotz is fourth, Muller is fifth, and they're still shuffling. Of course, the irony of all this is that had the 88 Mercedes still been going, it could have scored points with the, the, the dramas now affecting number 12 Audi, but it's already parked and out of the race. Now, does this explain anything about Christopher Hauser? He was yeah. already slow and had lost ground at that point. It, at all, to me, the car looked slow. Something happened at the point when Dennis Marshall passed, and yeah. I thought the car looked slow in um, at turn six, and then it was slow all for, through the rest of the lap. I thought he was going to come in, look to the obvious thing to do, but he stayed out, and then got himself compromised on the outside of turn 16. Yeah, it just didn't want to turn. It's almost like it's a slow puncture. It's not flat, but it's going down, and, and maybe that's why it won't turn, it won't give him the bite he needs. So... Let's hear, first of all, from Dennis Lind. He sadly is out of the race. Dennis Lind, we saw in the pits, uh, a retirement. He's with Gemma. Dennis, massively disappointing at this late stage to see you have to retire the car. What's the problem? Yeah, there was a technical issue on the car in the final sector, so I had to slow down not to cause any harm or injury to the car. So, uh, yeah, we will come back stronger in Valencia, but it's a shame now. We were in a good position. We had a bit of a struggle in the middle of the in the middle of the race, where so we dropped down a few positions, but uh, we did a pit stop and it seemed to fix it. So, yeah, we'll have to go back and check what it was. Thank you very much for talking to us. No worries. That's a fantastic non-answer from Dennis Lynn. Beautifully deflected. <laughs> First of all, to say a technical issue, which tells you nothing at all, and then to talk about the other stint. Brilliant job, Dennis. Well, he's a professional race driver. Absolutely. Right? He, he's and a been, politician. He's been through the school of, <laughs> of, of motorsport politics. <laughs> But there's a, they've got a glimpse of the front of the 46 hours. It's a bit battered and bashed. That was from what occurred much earlier in the first stint. And we haven't had a really good view close up of the front of the 46, but it is carrying a few war wounds. Might get a few more yet, because Nico Muller is not giving up in his quest to get onto terms with Lucas Stoltz. Uh, do you want to have a cheer for Porsche? As there, up the inside, tries to go Muller coming out of the hairpin, not quite able to do it. No. The Porsche because... cheer was because Cairoli is third. Well, let's give it a cheer because there was going to be an Audi whitewash. <laughs> now we've got an Audi, a Porsche in third, a Mercedes fourth, and Nico Miller right on the tail of that fifth place, a fourth place uh, Mercedes. There you see it. That's the onboard shot from the 46. Nico Miller behind the wheel, and there's 12 in, and finally made it back in. And with great sadness, Christopher Hauser has to get out of the car. And their car, their day, I mean, so late in the race, 10 minutes to go, and that car's in the pit lane. So, a spate of late race retirements. Quick look at the VMAX top speed. McLaren, 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 McLaren. Frederick Schoundorf, Dennis Lind, Dean McDonald, Norbert Siedler, all the bravest at 270, 271, up to 273 kilometers an hour through the parabolica up towards the hairpin. Right, we've got nine minutes to go. You've got Niederhauser, 4.3 seconds to the good. Dennis Marshall is not catching him particularly. He was fractionally quicker last time, but he's still got a big chunk to make up. But this is, in reality, is the remaining race for the remaining uh, top six positions, because first to second, second to third, have got four to five second gaps. But this is the battle right now for fourth position, and uh, Nico Miller 
well, he's had a couple of sniffs and almost a couple of laps to go here, find a way to get alongside the Mercedes, but just couldn't make it work. Closes again under brakes, closes down onto the rear of the Mercedes, but once you accelerate off, then the gaps exceed. Now that is the silver class leader, Mick Vishofer, for Emil Frey Racing. And he is running in seventh. He has been passed by Mirko Portolotti in 63, as you have seen. And he is four seconds ahead of Alex Arca in the Silver Cup. So barring a mistake out of Mick Vishofer, uh, he will carry on the good work of Konstantin Apolainen and Stuart White and bring home that car as a winner. Mirko Bortolotti has done the fastest lap of the race. And Patrick Niederhauser continues to lead, but a personal best middle sector by Dennis Marshall on this lap. Yes, uh, but he's 4.3 seconds behind. So we need a few purples rather than a few greens. Yeah, but he's just taken four tenths out in the middle sector alone. That's a lot of time to take out, but the gap is 4.3 seconds. Seven minutes, seven and a half minutes remaining. And that's only to catch to the tail of Patrick Niederhauser. It'd be a mighty effort for Dennis Marshall if he could run down the race leader in that remaining time. So as the cars come to the end of lap, 96, four seconds the margin uh, last time around, and as they accelerate through, the lap was quicker by Dennis Marshall, still over four seconds. That's your pro-am leader, Andrea Bertolini, taking over from uh, Louis Machiels in number 52, and that car heading then for 30th place. But where is Dominic Bauman's Mercedes? It is not that far behind. There's a car between them, but the margin in terms of time, only about eight tenths of a second. So Bertolini, then you've got a, a, a Mercedes out of position, then you've got the second placed Pro-Am car. That could yet change before the very end. Six there is the second place car. Six and a half minutes remaining, it'll be a big effort by Dominic Barman. If he can get on to the tail of Andrea Bertolini, the very experienced, almost, he must be on a pension from Ferrari. As Byman slips up the inside, that's a nice straight, well, I thought it was a nice straightforward overtake, but he gets it done, and that will give Byman, again, a little bit of hope. Well, what this also, yeah, as you say, gives Bauman hope. It also gives him a, a clear run now to the back of Andrea Bertolini. So, Pro-Am, there it is, that's going to go down to the wire, uh, because Bauman is looking quicker than Bertolini, and six minutes to go. Yeah, he needed that pass, that simple, in relative terms, overtake. And he's closing down onto the tail of the Ferrari pretty quickly indeed. It's almost by the corner, you can see the gap coming down. So there is Dominic Baum, and then top speed into the stadium, Albert Costa and Jules Gounon, when he was without problems, 164 kilometres an hour both, Richie Tomita 163, as also Michael Pedersen, and then Patrick Niederhauser 162 kilometres an hour, turning through that corner. There is Nico Muller, fifth he is now, heading, as we say, for the best endurance cup result for him, for Fred Vavish and Valentino Rossi. Pro-Am hustling on, Dominic Bauman chasing after the category leader. So Ferrari, Mercedes, probably not a lot of difference in overall performance. It'll be just simply down to which driver has preserved his tyres the best, which driver's got the best brakes. And right now, Dominic Bauman looks to be that driver. But of course, there's a four and a half, or five, just up five minutes to go. He can close them down. I think the Ferrari can become quite competitive in those closing four and a bit minutes. Into turn seven. Again, McLaren, McLaren, McLaren. Audi, McLaren, in terms of the top speeds. Not necessarily the expected names in those cars either. Maciej Blazic being rapid at 224 kilometers an hour. Now, there goes Bauman. In the first sector of this lap, he was slightly down on Bertolini, but through the next part of the lap, I suspect the Mercedes will have the grunt to be able to catch back up. Niederhauser has just gone through, breaking the timing beam with uh, less than five minutes to go now. Gaps down to 3.8 seconds, and Dennis Marshall is still pushing, albeit in sector one, there was a personal best from Niederhauser. It was a hundredth of a second or something quicker than that from Dennis Marshall, but nonetheless, 3.8 seconds and four minutes to go. That's almost a needless and possible challenge that uh, Marshall has got. But this is a real challenge that Bauman has got because it's for class honours as they come into turn 16. The Valwell Lamborghini goes through, Patrick Cooler at the wheel there, looking the background onto the pit straight, come Ferrari and Mercedes. Andrea Bertolini is ahead, but Dominic Bauman now lining up for a move, not at turn one necessarily. 
but maybe into the next tight right-hander. So this lap and arguably two more laps to the chequered flag. So can the Italian keep the Austrian behind? The Mercedes certainly looking the more competitive of the two cars. So it'll, maybe will it be traffic affected? I don't think that Fertolini is close enough to have anything interfere with his pace. And Bauman will be hoping that there is something that's going to interfere. Look, there's the gap between uh, Bertolini and that group of, what, seven or so cars directly ahead. And a big dive going on up the road there, looking the traffic. Thankfully, I think contact is avoided, as through now go 87 Mercedes. That is the fight still for fourth place, Stoltz versus Muller. And Nico Muller running out of time, running out of options, running out of ideas, but he is not running out of commitment. And then when he's got, again, Stoltz is going to have to face traffic with two and three quarter minutes of this race remaining. So into turn 15, 16. So again, whether the traffic will be the arbiter of who, what decides or who decides who will finish fourth or who will finish fifth. So across the line now. Into turn one, watch the Mercedes and the Audi. Well, pretty much even Stevens in terms of the amount of track used up the hill or up the short straight into turn two. Now, this is where it's going to get a bit tasty because Stoltz is getting into that zone where the back markers are going to have an effect on what he may have been able to consolidate. Accelerating now towards the Schmitzkehrer. Back markers, as you rightly say, may well be an issue in all of this. There is time for one more lap at the end of this, looking at the clock. As hard on the brakes, they dive now into the hairpin. Muller to the inside, he's tried this before, doesn't quite get the drive out of the corner, but he's oh so close. He's got good position. Uh oh, we're going to have to wait to see what happens in turn seven and into turn eight, because that could be an opportunity. Maybe the lad, but look at Bauman in the back yeah. of Andrea Bertolini likewise. So Bauman is ready for a dive. Look in the traffic as they come into the hairpin. No, not close enough to do it there. Bertolini's car quivers a little bit under braking, but Andrea Bertolini, massively experienced driver, knows exactly where to position that car. Yeah, now he's caught up to the tail of that traffic. There was a few seconds up the road to the inception McLaren, and they're not going to step out of the way. Let a Ferrari go through, no. you can guarantee that. Uh, the answer to whether or not Muller got past Stoltz is a negative. Uh, that is the race leader on his last lap now. Patrick Niederhauser heading for an Endurance Cup win. So too Christopher Meese, it's been a long time since his last one. And Lucas Legere, a maiden victory as he comes up towards turn two with a lap and a bit to go. Bauman versus Bertolini for Pro-Am. There may not be many in the class, but they're giving us a really good battle towards the end of the race as they come now down through turn 13. So keep one eye on this as Bauman again tries to get the drive out of the corner. Bertolini oh. sideways. Yes, Pat Ferrari tail snapped out of line and again, the pace that Bauman has got, putting, forcing Andrea Bertolini to use everything the Ferrari has got, but he has managed to get across start finish line, still ahead of the second place in category Mercedes. So now one lap remaining. What can you throw at it? Bauman has thrown pretty much everything he has. Bertolini has defended. And of course, he's concerned about, well, are we going to have that? Is that McLaren going to become an issue? Or can I keep the Mercedes behind me and still not get too close to the back of the inception McLaren? There is our race leader halfway round the final lap. Well, what a race it has turned out to be. It has given some of the uh, underdogs a chance to shine. It has given us plenty to talk about. And Patrick Niederhauser has done a fantastic job. He is on his way to victory. So are his co-drivers, Christopher Misa, and for the first time in the championship, Lucas Legere. Santa Locke, an overdue win. It's been a real stalwart team. Uh, yes, they've had a Spa 24 hours win, but they don't get that many outright race wins. But this has been a really good job done. Patrick Niederhauser comes through then to win the fourth round of Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe powered by AWS Endurance Cup at Hockenheim. And there is the delight at Santa Locke. <laughs> Lucas Legere, Christopher Meese and the team celebrate and a richly deserved win. Fantastic. Absolutely thoroughly deserved. A great job by the Santa Locke junior team to take victory here this afternoon and chased all the way by the attempt to argue. Dennis Marshall finishes 2.6 seconds behind. Here's the other battle I've been keeping an eye on. And it could change, it could change before we get to the check and flag. Bertolini in the Ferrari, Bauman in the Mercedes, a corner to go for Pro Am honours then at the end of three hours of racing. They are nose, two, tail. Bauman tries to get a different line through the corner. He's not quite close enough, and Andrea Bertolini is going to hang on in there. Ferrari wins Pro Am. What a battle.
right up to the line. Brilliant oh. stuff, Andrea Bertolini. That was for 30th place overall, but for a class win, and Andrea Bertolini, Louis Machiels, uh, and Stefano Costatini take honours. Troubled out, he limps to the line. That is 31. That goes through, at least it gets to the end. That was Diego Menchaca in 37th place. Get your breath back. Oh, I mean, I mean, it's, <laughs> what a three hours has been non-stop all the way through and then oh now uh, this is uh, as a living gold tower left rear tower's flat yeah this was the car that was dominating gold and it's going to finish fourth in class because in the end robert renau limps to the line and having dominated the class for most of the day a puncture on the last lap means that the inception racing mclaren wins in gold and down to fourth off the podium is 9 11. there's no justice i mean i mean what can you i mean it's been a hard race all the way through we haven't seen a novel of tyres cut down. Some of it has been due to carbon fibre shards from the incident that occurred in the opening lap, but to have a tyre cut down at this late stage, I mean, when you're in that powerful position, well, but look at the joy of Lucas Legere. I mean, he's such an unlikely looking racing driver. I mean, you see him <laughs> very tall, slender, glasses, and then you've got the little toughy Christopher Meese. Yeah. You know, you want him in your rugby scrum, wouldn't you? Sebastian Chatai being uh, the team owner, being congratulated by Chris Reinker of Audi and uh, Patrick Niederhauser. Great job. That Mirko Bortolotti takes the fastest lap of the race. Patrick Niederhauser sets that car's fastest lap, by the way, quicker than Christopher Meese. Well, I tell you what, the boys got promised. There's no <laughs> question about it. Absolutely great drive by Niederhauser. And I suppose it's the, it's, it's the day of the old guard having to stand down at some point. And uh, the Valentino Rossi fans looking on, celebrating that car's best result of the season. Uh, a fifth place in an endurance round, uh, in, a, in a way, helped perhaps by that long safety car period because there was only really half an hour of racing in that first stint. There wasn't much time that could be lost if time were to be lost. But in the end, uh, a very, very good middle stint by Verbeek bringing it into the mix and Nico Muller trying everything right to the very end. But there, through the winner's arch, comes the Santa Lock Audi, Christopher Meese and Lucas Legere head to the car to congratulate Patrick Niederhauser, winner of round four of the championship. <laughs> Here we go again. <laughs> now, thoroughly, I mean, when you see a team like Santa Lock Jr. winning a race on merit, yep. then you have to be happy for the team. No question. Superb job, that. And the winning drivers also calm down. We'll hopefully talk to Gemma for us, and then they'll go to the podium. But uh, a superb race with so much happening. I know a lot of it was perhaps down to people having problems, but just great stuff. Patrick Niederhauser, absolutely delighted. Oh, dear me. I mean, I don't know what the pit lane is feeling like. I mean, it's been a phenomenal race. So much taking place, so much tension, and so many late, you know, last minute shocks. The, the, the 911 Porsche limping across the line with that left rear tyre. Absolutely. So drama right the way to the wire. And the winning drivers there taking on water. Congratulations all round. <laughs> and uh, the number 30 Audi has just clinched the Silver Cup. Uh, because it was third in class. So late race dramas promoted it uh, one spot uh, and that got it ahead of 26, Nicholas Bart's Audi. So there, uh, Thomas Neubauer, Benjamin Goethe, Jean-Baptiste Simonard are third in the race and the new champions in silver with a round to spare. Well, great job by the 30 WRT the smile Audi Sable, team. A fantastic result. You worked really, really hard. The pressure right to the end, Patrick. Yeah, I mean, uh, we, I think this one go, goes to the entire team. Uh, we did, uh, we did a great job. The entire team from, yeah, from the car. I think uh, us drivers keep it together, also more or less, and team get uh, just a great strategy. So in all the pit stops, we could gain some positions, and uh, yeah, after a very tough spa, I'm just really, really happy it worked out for us now. Absolutely, a well-deserved win, and, and overdue perhaps for Santelot. Uh, I was waiting this one for so long, honestly, from the beginning of the year. We had the pace for sure to do some results and finally do it. Uh, it feels just amazing, honestly. So yeah, thank you Santelot, thank you everyone, yeah, just great.
And Chris, finally, just a quick word. We said to you earlier on how action-packed that race was, that final safety car. How hard is it for you watching on at the end, just willing it to be over? Uh, well, it's always harder to watch than to race yourself, but I had full trust into Patrick. And I want to say also thank you to the fans who came today. I mean, it's for the first time here with this uh, series. It has been fantastic. And to uh, top it with a win is just insane. A home win for you. Congratulations. Thank you well much. done. Thank you. Top job by Christopher Meese, Lucas Legere towering over him, and uh, Patrick Niederhauser. Yeah, I mean, that's a superb job by all three drivers. And uh, I mean, if you say Patrick Niederhauser, he is a racer, and that's what we come to see. We want to see racing, not just driving racing cars. And that was a great race all through the field. So much excitement from start to finish. Now, what about Dennis Marshall, Kim Lewis Ram, and Marcus Winkelhock? Second there with Gemma. Congratulations, second place. That was one tough race. We'll come to you first, Dennis. Yeah, awesome. A bit unexpected, to be honest. But uh, the pace in the car was great. We stayed out of trouble. The car was running really well. And yeah, in the NP2, uh, awesome, awesome job by Winky. I mean, his stint was awesome. Kimi, nice start. Thank you to them and thank you to the team. I mean, it's an outright home victory for all of you and the team, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. It's a super race. It's a super victory or a P2 for us, a great result. Coming here, expecting like maybe a top 10, a top 5 with a bit of luck, but finishing on the podium is just wonderful. Everyone did a perfect job. The team, the mechanics, my two teammates. Vinky was crazy with some overtakes today, but I think with age, he makes it quite good. <laughs> <laughs> Those overtakes really were mega. Watching on was just something else. Yeah, it was a good race, it was good fun. Uh, the car was working well all weekend. Uh, since the test day, we were happy with the car. Uh, pace was there all weekend long, and uh, we had some, some good, good, good moves in, the, in, the, in my stint. And, but you only can do it if the car is good, and it was good. So you know, I'm, I'm really happy being on the podium today. Certainly seems to be an Audi track. Well done, boys. Thank you. So second place for the Attempto team, Chris Reinker of Audi Sport. A happy man with a one, two, five in the end. Uh, it, uh, a real shame that the car collection car of Christopher Hauser retired because that again was the best we'd seen out of that. Vincent Voss is there. It's not often that the best that he can uh, take out of the team is fifth, but he's uh, able to go and congratulate the other Audi teams on their results. So uh, as the Audi tenure for WRT comes to an end, but. Uh, WRT taking fifth place, Nico Muller, along with uh, Frederick Lavish and Valentino Rossi. So the drivers for the uh, four podiums will be made ready. And uh, we can next hear from our third placed in silver drivers, but new champions, Thomas Neubauer, Benjamin Goethe and Jean-Baptiste Simonau. Boys, congratulations. You've closed the championship and you've taken the Silver Cup title. Feels good, right? <laughs> Yeah, it feels amazing. I mean, you know, it wasn't an ideal race for us. The first pit stop really didn't go away and we lost a lot of time. But um, yeah, we recovered really well. These guys did an amazing job to recover. And yeah, no, it feels, feels great to be champion now. Absolutely. You sat there looking a little bit hot and probably slightly worn out there, Tom. But you said to me at the start of the weekend, I'm not going to focus on the championship. I'm just focusing on today. But you've done it. Yeah, obviously, we still have one race after this, Barcelona. So, uh, so it not, was not a weekend where we were playing a big gamble. So, yeah, we were tra just trying to focus on ourselves. Uh, it was a difficult race. Uh, we had uh, not the race we wanted, uh, even though we had a very good qualifying, getting pulled another point. Uh, but, yeah, I think this resumed very well this, this season, which, uh, which had up and downs, and then the team stayed together. And then in the end, we're here on the first step of the podium for the championship. So, mega job by everybody. Absolutely, a fantastic job, JB. Just a final word from you. I mean, that was, as Thomas said, one difficult race and challenging, but uh, the results are what matter. Yeah, yeah I would say at the championship, uh, on all the races, was never easy. We had to go to take it again. After the pit stop, it was, uh, was difficult to get back into it. I know I had to do, like, to push from beginning to the end, try to close the gap. Was not easy, like, yeah, as he said, had, uh, had to push, but, yeah, I shown that the team never gave up. None of us, uh, none of us did. Like in Porica, like in Spa, like always have to come back. And uh, I think that's the strength of WRT. Well done to all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So our first champions crown then, the silver champions. And uh, that car, come the end of the season, I suspect will be another one for Earl Goethe's collection of Gulf Lurid successful racing cars. Uh, so let's look at the race results then. Patrick Niederhauser, the race winner, along with Lucas Legere and Christopher Meese. It is Santa Locke, 
ahead of Attempto. Marcus Winkelhock, Kim Louis Schramm, and Dennis Marshall second. And then Porsche third, out of nowhere, really. Uh, just got on with the job all afternoon. Chipped away. Klaus Backler, Alessio Piccariello, Matteo Caroli ahead of Mario Engel, Lucas Stoltz, and Steins Korthorst. Fifth, Fred Verbeek, Nico Muller, and Valentino Rossi. And sixth, in the end, Jack Aitken, Albert Costa. Great stint by Mirko Bortolotti. The silver winners, Konstantin Apolainen, uh, Mick Bishofer and Stuart White ahead of Mario Sug, Nicholas Scherl and Alex Arker. Ninth, Max Hesse, Neil Verhagen and Dan Harper. And 10th overall, third in silver, new silver champions, Jean-Baptiste Simonau, Benjamin Goethe and Tomo Neubauer. Uh, 15th, the gold winners, Oli Nilroy, Brendan Areeve and Frederick Schandorf taking gold cup honours uh, with drama before Link, the Herbert Motorsport Porsche at the end. Second in gold, Hubert Haupt, Arjun Meini and Florian Scholzer. Third in uh, gold, Hugo Delacour, Cedric Sparazzuoli and Alessandro Balzan. That meant fourth in the end with a puncture, Ralph Bone with Alfred and Robert Renard as his co-drivers. And Pro-Am, 30th, Stefano Costatini, Louis Machiels and Andrea Bertolini just fending off Dominic Bauman by 0.276 of a second. The Sky Tempesta Mercedes coming home in 32nd place. And have a look at the number of cars out of the 49 starters that didn't make it. 12 retired uh, with uh, all sorts of dramas befalling a number of them prior to that chequered flag. So, uh, great racing all the way through and uh, lots of stories, both good and bad news stories in a sense. Some having a good day, others having a bad day and Rob Bell having the worst of all. Out of the race on the first lap at a wrecked car uh, Rob, OK, he's confirmed that to us and uh, good to see him out of the car so quickly after that big hit. So the drivers are all being rounded up behind the podium. Uh, podiums plural, the teams await at the bottom of the podium as we get set for the overall podium to be first of all. So the teams are in good voice, no doubt. They're on the uh, left, Miguel Ramos. And it is going to be the overall top three in reverse order, first of all. So to third place, the Dynamic Motorsport Porsche team of Matteo Cairoli, Klaus Backler and Alessio Picriello that come first. It's good to have Alessio back from racing in Asia into Europe, where he can remind people of his ability for second place. Marcus Winkelhock, Kim Lewis Graham and Dennis Marshall step forward for the Attempto Racing team. Big, big cheer for Arkinaka's drivers. But the top step of the podium, and perhaps the noisiest cheer of all, is going to go for the Santaloc Junior team with the very tall figure of Lucas Legere, the diminutive Christopher Meese and Patrick Niederhauser as the race winners. Out they come. Race winners at Hockenheim, Christopher Meese, Lucas Legere and Patrick Niederhauser. The Santaloc drivers to the podium, the team represented there as well. And for the French team, they will be the national anthem of the winning team. So well done to Santaloc, the trophies to be presented in a moment. And uh, as there, the uh, presentations to be made, courtesy of championship sponsor Fanatec. The trophies, first of all, to the Porsche drivers. And that, John, an effort that just came good as the race went on, didn't it? They, they did everything they could for that car and the places came to them. Yeah, I mean, if you haven't got the out and out pace to go and challenge for the lead, the next best thing you can do is keep out of trouble and just keep going. And eventually, a result will come to you. And I think that's the case with the Dynamic Motorsport Porsche. They got that third podium slot. They probably didn't anticipate it before the race started, but they're going to take it. Look, points are points are points. And so the winning drivers will receive the trophies from Fanatec, our championship sponsor, of course, as Christopher Meese, Patrick Niederhauser, and Lucas Legere are winners at Hockenheim. It's a win for Santa Locke. Two trophies, now three. 
Race winners, Lucas Legere, Christopher Meese, and Patrick Niederhauser. Trophies in the air, big cheers from down in the pit lane. The champagne is sprayed, and the delight of the Santalot drivers. And Christopher Meese, although he's been busy winning in perhaps the longer races like Nürburgring and elsewhere, it's been a while since we've seen him take a win in an Endurance Cup race in Fanatec GT in Europe. I mean, I've always had a, a sort of a soft spot for Christopher Meese because I feel he's one of those professional drivers, how do you've got a number of them on their books, who always gets in and delivers and does the professional driver's job. And you know, I don't know what age Christopher is, he's in his middle, late 30s now, as is Manfred and Marcus Winkelhock, both of them today drove the wheels off their Audi. Now the younger men are coming through, and certainly Patrick Niederhauser is a classic example of that. And there are going to be many more, both at Sonadi or any of the other teams around the racetrack. Well, it was a good job done, certainly. This is how the championship looks. No change at the top. Jules Gounon, Daniel Junquedea, Raphael Marcello, still that 11 points clear of Daniel Serra, who wasn't even here. Couldn't have scored if he'd have wanted. Davide Rigon and Antonio Fuoco. Lucas Stolt, Stein Scott Horst uh, are then uh, third ahead of Mauro Engel in the battle. But it will still go down to Barcelona. 11 points. It's still advantage Mercedes, but what a championship showdown we have been offered in the overall uh, category, the Pro Cup. So the uh, top three drivers, teams, combinations make their way off the podium. And now we prepare for the gold, the silver, and the Pro-Am. We await the next category to be brought forward. And it's going to be the silvers that are next. So Jean-Baptiste Simonard, Benjamin Goethe, and Thomas Neubauer brought forward for WRT. Third place for the Audi drivers. It's another Audi next. It's going to be second place for the Attempto Racing combination of Alex Arca, of Marius Zug and Nicolas Scherl. So second overall, second silver, the two different Attempto cars. But for Emil Frey Racing, it is a silver win. And it's a first win for Constant Apollinen, for Mick Vishofer, and for Stuart White, who will be brought forward then for the Emil Frey Racing team. There is Stuart, who lets his co-drivers step forward first. Great job done by Stuart, and along with Mick Vishofer, and of course, Constant Apollinen. Emil Frey Racing taking honors in silver, the winning team. And of course, therefore, Lamborghini, the winning brand. And for the uh, Swiss team, it's national anthem to be played. An excellent result for the Emil Frey racing team. And uh, again, that was one of those races where we were saying in terms of the overall battle, some of the underdogs were able to shine. John, I, I suppose the same in silver, because we were able to see there just how good the likes of Comsol Apollinen and Stuart White uh, and in that final stint, Mick Vishofer really were. I mean, it's, it's all the way through. I mean, I think we've had a fantastic race here. That today, I mean, the circuit has clearly done what it was designed to do. And it's had people, teams, cars, brands, maybe out of position initially, but able to come in and challenge them. I mean, all through the four different categories, just been a fantastic afternoon's racing. True enough, as the trophies come again from Fanatec, sponsors of the GT World Challenge, and of course the eSports Pro Series that we had last night, that Danny Junkadea won. It's the only consolation for Akodis ASP, they got points in the team's championship. Emil Frey Racing takes the team's trophy. And then the trophies to Silver Cup winners, Mick Vishofer, Consul Apollinen, and Stuart White. There goes the final trophy, champagne for the winning team, and trophies are lost for the photographers, and then it's time to scatter, isn't it, as the champagne is going to be sprayed. Oh no, there's also the uh, Pirelli Awards to be given to the drivers as well, because for the season-long entrance in Silver Cup, there are third for one set of tyres, second place a set of Pirelli rubber, and a 
voucher, if you like. Two sets of tyres for the category winner. Photographs taken and trophies down, champagne up. Everybody continues the fight on the podium. The Emil Frey rep is the first one with the bottle, soaks his drivers. And the silver champions celebrate a third place on the podium, but a title one with a round to go. The silver cup, good innovation. And uh, we'll see the gold cup top three very shortly as well. So the drivers then set to make their way from the podium. There is confirmation of the new champions, Benjamin Goethe, Thomas Neubauer, and Jean-Baptiste Simonat, Nicolas Scherl, Alex Arco, Mario Sug, 10 points up on Stuart White and Constant Apolline. And so that battle will continue in Spain with Axel Jeffries, Alfaisal Albu, Zubaya, and then Fabian Schiller uh, next in the standings out of the treble. Seven Mercedes that faded a bit, really, after that opening stint. We didn't really see that much of them during the course of the race today. But then again, none of the Mercedes really looked that sparkling. So the trophies for the gold podium being uh, made ready. And the Barcelona circuit, the traditional end of season venue now for the Endurance Cup will be the first weekend of October, first and second weekend. But the 17th and 18th of September is when we're in Valencia, two weeks time for the uh, Sprint Cup final round. So there the uh, Silver Cup drivers make their way off the podium. The SRO team round up the drivers and go and find third in gold, which will be Alessandro Balzan, Hugo Delacour and Cedric Sprazzoli. Then for second place, it is going to be Arjun Maini, Hubert Haupt and Fabian Schiller. There are the Ferrari drivers making their way to the podium from AF Corsa. For second place, Hubert Haupt, Florian Schotzer, and Arjun Maini. There they are, with uh, Hubert Haupt, the owner of the team, towering over his drivers as he strides to the podium. And uh, then the category winners, good result, great result for Optimum Motorsports, Brendan Areeb, Frederick Schandhoff, and Oli Milroy. There are the drivers, Oli Milroy and Brendan Areeb, made a good combination racing in uh, Asian Le Mans, as well as in WEC, as well as, of course, in Fanatec GT. And Frederick Schandorf, the third driver, plus the Inception Racing team represented on the podium. And uh, again, a big, big fight as ever in the Gold Cup in this penultimate round of the championship as the Inception Racing drivers celebrate on the top step. So well done to the winning drivers. Trophies set to be presented. And there, Bernhard Conrad, the team lead uh, of mechanical engineering at Fanatec, presents to Cedric Sprazzoli, to Alessandro Balzan, to Hugo Delacour for third place. Then for the second placed Mercedes drivers, Hubert Haupt, Arjun Maini, and uh, also, of course, to Florian Schotzer. And uh, then there will be the trophies to the winners, to Inception Racing, the team's trophy, and, of course, the driver's trophies as well. Gold Cup winners, Oli Milroy, Brendan Areeb, and Frederick Schandorf. Smiles all round from... Happy drivers and a happy team, and with everybody now with the silverware. Pirelli awards conceivably to come, let's just check. Although they're only for silver, champagne is at their feet. The flag's being changed in readiness for the next podium, the last podium 
but the inception racing McLaren a really good job good fight all the way through that category and it was I mean again I repeat what I've said earlier every class four classes here this afternoon it's been tight been great battles and those battles got intermixed with other class battles going on so you're in your own little world and you've got a, the leading cars coming through you've got to think about how do I defend my own position but not concede so anyway it was just I think thoroughly enjoyable all afternoon and good to see one or two of the other teams as we've been saying shining as well rather than uh, the uh, regular favorites what this does in gold is now put Milroy Shandhoff and Irib ahead of Rahel Frey and Sarah Bovi and Michel Gatting so a change for the category lead therefore within the gold cup so Ollie Milroy, Frederick Shantor, Brendan Areeb take over the category lead and the dramas at the end, of course, costing Robert Renner, Alfred Renner and Ralph Bone points. They are third with one more Endurance Cup round still to go. One more podium still to go too. That is for the Pro-Ams, which has not been great in terms of the numbers this weekend compared to other rounds, but it was probably the, one of the closest finishes. That was a very close finish. I mean, I think we had three Pro-Am entries which is like the lowest we've ever had and I can't remember how long but that battle with Dominic Barman all the way through to the end of Andrea Bertolini was a highlight of the race albeit it came in the last 15 or so minutes well there to the podium come the third place Enrique Chavez, Milgram Ramos uh, and uh, the team principal Alexander West there uh, Ian Loggi, Valentin Pierberg and Dominic Bauman second and Pro-Am winners are Stefano Costatini, Louis Machiels and Andrea Bertolini. Andrea Bertolini hung on to get to the flag ahead by, in the end, just 0.276 of a second. You can't buy experience, no. you earn it. Very true. That's what Andrea Bertolini is all about. A win for AF Corsa, for Alessandro, uh, sorry, for Andrea Bertolini, for Louis Machiels and Stefano Costatini in the Pro-Am Cup. Well done then to the Pro-Am winners, Stefano Costatini, Louis Machiels and Andrea Bertolini. The trophies are ready to be presented and uh, they come then from, again, Fanatec. First of all to Miguel Ramos, to Enrique Chavez, to Alexander West, bouncing back after the damage at Spa. And let's have a look as the presentations continue at the highlights of the race, which began with plenty of drama as the field poured through the first corner but it was by the end of the lap we'd had Valentino Rossi off the road that we then had the dramas that brought out the safety car when Rob Bell was suddenly spat across the racetrack hard into the barrier clobbered one barrier clobbered a second Rob okay but the car not so debris flew safety car deployed it was a long safety car period on the restart the two iron links Ferraris amazingly got themselves together and off the road went Alessio Rivera into retirement the second place car of the championship therefore not scoring but there was more drama to come as Arnold Robin got turned around. And as a way blasted, Danny Juncadea in number 88. That car was struggling for pace. And he was going to be dropping further and further away as the race wore on. Drama also for Chris Frogger as he tried to get past a rather uncooperative Porsche. Got crossed up after contact and was then hit again. This time by the Mad Panda Motorsports Mercedes. They sorted themselves out, carried on, and the fields swarmed down through turns seven and eight with battles taking up attention across the three stints. It was becoming an Audi race. We'd lost the WRT number 32 car. Then Stein Scott Horse made mistakes in number two Mercedes. He fell back through the pack as well. And it was becoming uh, a fight between Luca Giotto in the number 12 and then 25 Christopher Meese. The last round of pit stops cycled through and it gave us Patrick Niederhauser in the lead of the race being chased by uh, Christopher Hauser drama for number 51 Ferrari puncture tar bringing Nicholas Nielsen into the pit lane and that was the end of the race for that car but in the end despite all the battles that raged on Patrick Niederhauser was unstoppable he was a race winner by 2.6 seconds come the end Patrick Niederhauser Lucas Legere and Christopher Meese taking honors uh, we had a late race interruption after this drama for uh, Hugo Vallon into the tyres and on the restart more shuffling went off at the uh, Santa Lock Audi unstoppable up front so it has given us plenty of drama as far as the championship is concerned with Jules Gounon 88 Mercedes stopping out on track late race and that car 
not scoring. Christopher Hauser was a retirement late race as well. We've got one more round to go in Endurance Cup. This was how Pro-Am ended up with Andrea Bertolini just ahead of uh, Dominic Bauman to the chequered flag. But it is going to be drama in Spain. Sprint Cup in two weeks' time. Barcelona at the start of October. But from John Watson, Gemma Scott and David Addison for now, it's goodbye.